You are listening to the Roberta Glass True Crime Report, putting the true back in true crime. From New York City, Roberta Glass is now on the record. Okay. Hello, everybody. How you doing? So I got a message today on Twitter, a direct message from none other than Devin Tracy. Always encouraging. For those of you who are, uh, aren't watching the screen. It says, LLL, you're so effed. (gasps) Oh, (laughs) so I thought I'd come on and talk about a few things today. One, I'd like to make some psychic predictions (laughs) about where I think Devin Tracy's going to go, because there's only so many places you can go with Amanda Knox. The evidence, there's so much evidence against her. So you have to clean the crime scene. So you have to make it very small. You have to make it just Meredith Kircher's room, the room of the stage. Then you have to totally ignore Philomena's room. So don't expect to hear Devin talk about Philomena's room. If only, if he does mention it, it's going to be like, well, of course she lived there. Of course there's going to be. Meredith's blood mixed with Amanda Knox's blood, right? In a place in Philomena's room, the hallway. Then there's Amanda's bloody footprints. What are we supposed to believe that sh- that that were cleaned and discovered under luminol? What are we supposed to believe about that? I don't think that will be dealt with at all. It will all be about the knife and the low copy DNA. So. What does that mean? So it means that there is very little DNA left. So when they tested it again, many years later, Meredith Kircher's DNA did not show up, but Amanda Knox stood there on the handle. And then it's in Raffaello Selecito's drawer. So there goes. So Amanda Knox supporters just throw that out. It can't be that knife. Because when they tested it again, there wasn't enough DNA. So it means that it, the first test was wrong. The second test was right. You know, you could throw out the knife entirely. But why I think it's important is because Raffaele tells us it's important. In his prison diary, he wrote, the fact, quote, The fact that there is Meredith's DNA on the kitchen knife is because once when we were all cooking together, I accidentally pricked her hand. I apologized immediately. And she says, and she said, it was not a problem. And then to explain why he wrote that, he writes, he said, quote, I write, he said, quote, I was in a total panic because I thought Amanda killed Meredith or maybe helped someone kill her. Amanda may have stitched me up by taking the knife and giving it to the son of a bee who killed Meredith, unquote. So why is he tailoring the evidence? We won't hear about that. We'll just hear Raph was going crazy in jail and crazy in a way in which he only wanted to tailor the evidence. So, and I also am going to make actually some more predictions here, some more psychic predictions. If you are looking for, by the way, occasionally, occasionally, I do misspeak or get some pieces wrong. And there's usually a correction in my episodes. So if you are listening and you think 
just check out the description of my episodes. I often put corrections in there. I try to be as factual as I can, but occasionally I get things wrong and I try to correct them. I am human. I think he's going to jump all over things like little things that I said, like I mentioned, I pointed out Amanda Knox's creepy eyes and said immediately after, don't straw man my argument. That is not why I think she's guilty, but that's going to be all cut out. It's going to be like, whoa, Roberta thinks she has creepy eyes. She doesn't like her. She smells. And I think he's going to go great right back into that refrain that they were friends and, and she had no motive, but they weren't friends. They started out trying to be friends, but by the, by the date, by the beginning of November, the date of Meredith Kircher's murder, they were really at odds. And one of the things that I'm sure didn't make Amanda Knox happy, and let me see if I can try to show this to you, was that Meredith went to a Halloween party and Amanda was trying to text her and trying to meet up with her, but Meredith blew her off. She'd had enough of Amanda at this point. So take a look. So there's Meredith in her vampire Halloween costume with her English friends. Where's Amanda? not there doesn't uh, that is obviously not proof that they weren't there but her friends testified that you know her friends gave testimony to the police that she was not there that they were all hanging out together and obviously Amanda Knox was texting Meredith trying to meet up with her that night so That is, wait, did you guys see that? Wait, let me try that again. Let me try that again. I'm not sure if you saw it or not. I'll try it one more time just to make sure. Just one more time. Okay. Nope, it's not coming. Uh, somehow I'm not being able to share my screen. All right. Well, that is... <laughs> It's a Halloween picture. I'll try to put it up in maybe my Facebook page. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. I don't know why I'm having such trouble sharing my screen, but um, I, I'll just try just for the heck of it. Why don't we try one more time just to really put it. I don't think, yeah, no, my share screen isn't working, huh? That's really strange. All right. Well, I'll try to put it up in my community tab, at least, if not that, my Facebook group, so you guys can see what I'm talking about. This is going to be a short episode if my share screen isn't working because I have so many things that I do want to share. But let's, other thing is... I think he was going to jump all over that I said that Rudy Gooday wasn't a career criminal or a home invader. So what he was accused of was breaking into a law office, which I don't consider a home. There's no proof that he that he actually broke into that office other than he had the computers from it. So you could say he did it fine. But, you know, they have... They, they bringing up this testimony from this guy who got laughed out of court, who said that Rudy attacked him with a knife and he didn't even show up to court. The judge totally um, chewed him out. And as for the breaking in, in a, I think it was a daycare, the woman ha um, testified that she gave Rudy the key. So that's not a career, whether he was wanted there or not. He's not my favorite person, Rudy Gooday. I think he was absolutely involved in this crime. But what my point is, is that it benefited 
Amanda and Raffaele to make Rudy Goudet look like some career criminal, what they call him, like loner, roamer. I mean, he had roots in Perugia. He was known. And he's also a drug dealer. So often drug addicts steal stuff and will trade drugs for the things that they steal. So that could be a possibility. But equally a possibility is that he could have broken into that law office and stolen stuff. But he was known in Perugia. He grew up there. So not hardly like some roaming guy. And he was known to Amanda Knox. So when Amanda Knox wrote a list of seven names, the last person she described was someone that fit Rudy Goudet's description in in his habits. He was he played basketball with the boys downstairs. She says he's from South Africa. He's from the Ivory Coast. It's interesting when you listen to the secret police transcripts, she seems unsure where he's from. So that's kind of an interesting thing. Did she know? Did she? But they had socialized, gone out to at least once to a club together, is my understanding. I'm remembering that off the top of my head. Don't quote me on it. Um, I'll look into it a little bit more. But someone asked me, if and now that I'm so nervous about my share screen, but we'll try. Let's see here. Let's see if we. Someone asked me about Rudy Gooday and whether he, what he has said. And I disregard everything Rudy Gooday says. I look at the totality of the evidence presented in court. Rudy Goudet, in my opinion, is an unreliable narrator. So it so it doesn't matter much to me that he didn't that he said Amanda wasn't there at one point on an intercept call to his friends. And then at another point, he said that there was someone with light brown hair and high cheekbones, a shorter man. That could have been a description of Raffaele, who knows, with a knife. Raffaele collected knives. We know that. But let me just try to show you this. Whoop. Okay, so, so the top. Meredith Kircher's killer, one of them. Let me just turn this off. Rudy Goudet said she tried to tell him something as she died. See, that's a ridiculous story. And that she was writing something on the walls and her own B L O O D. I just, I can't believe that. And Amanda Knox was 101% there. I take that. I, I disregard that totally. So, but other people were interested in what he had to say. He did, did implicate them. And if you think about it, he's already doing, he already took a fast track to trial, right? What is, what is the benefit of, him saying, I did this in concert with two other people or in trying to make his part look better and saying, I did it alone. I mean, he was doing the same amount of time. There's not a huge incentive for him to blame her. So, and he's generally given just very few interviews, but he did give a long one in, in Italian that has been translated, but it's all such nonsense. I, just think it would be kind of be a waste of time to go over, but okay. People are really interested. Uh, we can watch it together if that interests you. Please support the channel by using the super chats and stickers to leave a comment or to ask me a question. Subscribe to my Patreon for exclusive podcasts and other content and hit the notification bell to be notified every time I go live because I've been doing just a lot of these like surprise, <laughs> like, hey, pop-ups. I guess it's a pop-up podcast. So I just wanted to go over, I mean, there was just so much, so much uh, uh, blood, blood all over the scene. And, and there was a cleanup. You can't deny there was a cleanup because footprints that 
lit up under luminol, meaning they were done in, in blood, in Amanda's foot, also different shoes. But there's a perfect imprint of Raph's foot on the bath mat. And there's Amanda's impression in in um, that lit up under luminol in her room in the hallway. There was a cleanup. And even Rudy Goudet in his intercept call said they're like, oh, the hallway where there's so much blood. So I don't know. Was there? But we do know that Amanda Knox and Meredith were bleeding at the same time because there's the mixed blood of Meredith and Amanda in the bathroom. And there's just Amanda's blood on the faucet. And there's mixed DNA that lights up under luminol, meaning it's blood. Or if you're a Amanda Knox supporter, it's either carrots or horseradish. <laughs> Take your pick. What is, what is more likely? Combined with the fact that she falsely accused her boss, Patrick Lumumba, let him sit in prison. So even if, the, say, even if that were, say, a coerced false accusation, wouldn't she immediately want to ret retract it and say, oh, no, I've done something terrible? And even still, even if she regrets it and feels badly about it now that she's out walking amongst us, why hasn't she paid him the money she owes him? I mean, I heard like a really ridiculous argument in the comments like, oh, the Italian justice system accused Patrick Lumumba. Oh, really? Where did they get that idea to do that from? I think it was from Amanda Knox. So it's just so funny the way Amanda Knox supporters will really, like they're part of the cleanup crew. They'll just make the crime scene smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And that is what innocence fraud is all about. Okay. So I wanted to do all of this. I did half of this the other day, so it might bore some of you, but I wanted to try to do this all in one shot. And this is a discussion between Devin and myself, uh, Devin Tracy, atheism is unstoppable, who says that, quote unquote, we are, quote, at war, unquote, and that I should be scared. What he meant by that Twitter message, I believe, if my interpretation is correct, that I should be so scared of his awesome powers of research and putting a video together. But you know, he's just going to say, throw out the knife. But once you throw out the knife, you still have all the rest of the evidence. And then all the, all the weird things, Amanda putting herself at the scene. How did Amanda know that Meredith Kircher screamed loudly? There was multiple witnesses who, who heard a scream that night and heard, heard running. So, okay. So let's watch this together. Let's just skip through the intro. Heard it phrased like that. But, and that's the subject of today's episode. Welcome, Devin Tracy. So what made you want to start talking about the wrongful conviction movement? Well, I've never heard it phrased like that. Uh, wrongful conviction movement. Interesting. That's funny that there's a name. Yeah, I guess I'm on the outside, but I've independently discovered that there's a lot of shenanigans going on and it doesn't get covered. And so what you'll have is random people like me who, you know, I'm not from this field per se, but I do consider myself a morally grounded person. I mean, I am an Eagle Scout. I like to. An Eagle Scout who likes to call women who don't agree with him, dumb bees, <laughs> cat ladies. Dumb Jew broads, that kind of thing. <laughs> okay. I guess that's what they teach you in Eagle Scouts. To brag about to my audience. And I'm not seeing anyone else cover a lot of these cases. And I'm hearing, in fact, the opposite. I'm seeing the New York Times and very popular podcasts and very famous people stating things that are completely false and in a morally egregious way, effortlessly. 
And so it is shocking and appalling. That's exactly what you're doing now, Devin. Exactly what you're doing now. I'm shocked and appalled that you're doubling down on your support of Amanda Knox. For what reason? I mean, if uh, we'll get into it. And I feel like it's my duty to point out to whoever cares to listen that this is an outrage. I agree. I independently like research these cases. And every time I go into one, I'm hoping I'm wrong. I'm hoping like, oh, well, maybe they do have a case here. Like, why would they put their reputations behind something if it was so obviously one way? And I- Yeah, but there's often you don't, you know, we all make mistakes doing this. There are so many facts. You are bound to make a mistake here and there. But in your Central Park 5 video, you say that Mateus Reyes's DNA was found inside Trisha Mele. No, that DNA was found inconclusive. His DNA was found on a sock next to her. And you never corrected it. It just sort of sat there. You know, I mean, it's just with reporting on these cases, it's very important to strive to get it right. I don't always get it right. I can just hear that being clipped off with some kind of mistake I made. But you do make mistakes. We are human. But the difference is, is do you have the humility to go back and correct it? And that seems to be what you're doing with Amanda Knox. You fell for her innocence fraud. We all did, or I did, certainly. When, and then now it just seems odd. That's the, that's the messages I'm getting. What's wrong with Devin? Why is he, why is he holding water for this psycho? I... I really do feel like I come into it with an open mind. And then I'm just shocked when the evidence just piles up and up and up. And I'm like, what am I watching here? Do you hear that from your audience? Because I hear that a lot, that I think everybody's guilty. And I always try to explain (laughs) that I'm always hoping that every case I look at is a case of a wrongful conviction. I just haven't found one of the cases that I've covered. But do you find that the people say to you, you think everybody's guilty? Or also they use the word biased a lot. Do you get that? No, uh, I think people realize that it's very uneventful to pick a case that is, I don't know, like, you got to be careful of confirmation bias. That is true. But that's not how I come to these cases. There are a ton of situations that it just doesn't interest me because it's so open and shut. If there's a gray zone, like, I, I'm just so... Where's the gray zone with Amanda Knox? Where's the gray zone? And he's going to, he's gonna, right here, he's going to mention Scott Peterson. There is so much more evidence against Amanda Knox than Scott Peterson. That's what baffles me about these. Whenever, when someone tries to criticize me and says, say, oh, you think everyone's guilty. No, I don't. There's obviously wrongfully convicted people out there. I would cover those cases if I found them, but it's one case is more ridiculous than the next when you really get into it, when you go beyond the PR propaganda. There's definitely way more, way more evidence against Amanda Knox than Scott Peterson. So irritated by how confident people are, and they're so wrong. I mean, you could not be more wrong. <laughs> and I agree, Devin, you couldn't be more wrong. I feel like they get behind a case, a wrongful conviction case, because... It's like this underdog story where they think we got to help this person. You know, I'm going to be heroic here. And there's a great injustice being done. Meanwhile, ironically, they're taking part in a savage injustice, which is these victims are dead and forgotten half the time. And no one is. Yeah, I agree. That's why it's a it's a passion project for people like me and Martin Pribe and the few other people who speak out about innocence fraud innocence watch uk we're not in this for the money if we, we would have to be the most irrational nutso people to be in it for the money we're morally repulsed by this movement that's trying to free the most dangerous and deranged killers and in and doing it exactly the same way each time documentary pr agency same kind of figures. And then the killers that get exonerated, quote unquote, or get out, they go right back into the Innocence Project 
and and support other killers. Meaning they go back in working for the Innocence Project hand in hand with these other killers. So it just seems like, you know, if you look at these things just on the surface, they all look really good. They all have really good PR campaigns. Representing them. Mm -hmm. You know, and their family is all traumatized and there's no money and there's no movement behind supporting these victims. And if it's a district attorney, you know, these people are busy and they've moved on. There's a hundred other cases they're working on. So who is going to stand up for those people? Mm -hmm. And instead you get these narratives that are built and it's these stories and you can see the emotional notes that they're hitting and it's so predictable and it's repetitive. I can't believe a single person buys into it, but then you go on TikTok and you go on social media and it's like... How much research are these people putting into these cases? What they ask me is, have how much research did you put into Amanda Knox before you made your first Amanda Knox videos many years ago? And you seem to push the first one out really quick. You were like, oh, pretty women don't kill. End of story. Rudy Goudet. So I have no issue, although some of the things you said about Rudy Goudet, like there being a, like sperm on at the crime scene was untrue. There was a few things that were untrue that you said about Rudy Gaudet, but he's very guilty, just like Raph, just like Amanda. You're totally on board. The, the DNA, you know, the evidence that convicts Rudy Gaudet is all correct. But any evidence that could, DNA evidence that can, can looks makes Amanda and Raph look guilty is all wrong and corrupted. And seriously, there are like three of us talking about this innocence fraud movement. I mean, I can really, and you know, we were here way before you uh, talking about it, probably foolishly because, foolishly, because there's just no joy in it or money in it. You know, Martin Pribe, and Innocence Fraud Watch UK. That's it. That's it. That's that's who there is who does this on a full-time basis and me. That's it. So I say this, what I'm saying is I say this with no joy. There's not a lot of benefit in it for me to say Amanda Knox is guilty. Certainly with all the PR that she's had in America. But still, people, she, people sense something with her, especially women. Have you gone to the Innocence Project website? That's their research. Oh, my God. And that seems to be the press's research, too, on these cases. And the Innocence Project, I think, I don't think I'm being cynical here. I legitimately think that the word innocence is enough for people. That's their due diligence. <laughs> They go, well, how, why am I trusting the Innocence Project? Well, have you not seen the title of their name? I had the same thought. I was, <laughs> Are they just well-branded? Well, here's my thing. So a uh, little backstory. I was from LA, well, born in New York, but raised out there. And I had a step uncle who was working as a lawyer for the city. And he had an inside access somehow networking to get me into the OJ Simpson trial. So I went to the trial live. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. I'm glad you're talking about it. Well, this is what sort of started me into it. I wasn't just inherently interested in crime cases because I'll tell you why. I found them to be kind of boring and kind of just like, where is the controversy? I get that everyone gets a defense, but I mean, theoretically, there might be a case where, you know, it's kind of iffy and there's legitimate doubt either way, but it's not that sensational. But then the OJ case comes around and it's interesting because it was sensational and because he's a celebrity, but the mountain and avalanche of evidence in that case and for that to have had the outcome that it had and to be celebrated by the number of people that celebrate that outcome was to me, I would say it's traumatic. Like, I don't think I've ever really recovered from that. And to realize that that wasn't a one-off, it wasn't just an abortion of justice. It was calculated. They created that. You know, this was very willfully done, and it's been repeated over and over and over again. Willfully, willfully done, just like Amanda Knox and her PR team. She, her dad hired a PR agent before he hired a lawyer, Gregory Marriott. Why would they need him? Why not spend all the money if you're innocent on a really good Italian lawyer? Why do you need a PR agent to propagandize to the American public unless you know that the evidence is strong against you and that you want to rally up Americans 
So they'll put pressure on the Italian justice system, which is exactly what happened. Again, and things matter in that case that should not have mattered, like race. And we've seen that come back over and over and over again. And even the jurors, they get interviewed after that. And they go, why did you um, find this guy not guilty? And they said, oh, uh, to get revenge for the uh, Rodney King. They're like, what? To get what? To get revenge against, you know, the white man in the system for what they did with Rodney King. And it's like, OK, so we're not even talking about facts and we're not talking about justice. We're involved in something totally separate here. And that has been really eye opening for me. And I have been picking up patterns ever since. Isn't that interesting that he's talking about just dismissing the entire justice system? Just like we're not talking about facts anymore. We're talking about something else. Isn't that what's going on here? Since. And, you know, I sort of backed into it only because I wasn't satisfied that anyone else was doing it and they weren't. Not the way I'm going to do it. And so I happily stepped into the role. And you say in many of your videos, it's sort of a shorthand to explain why you don't support the Innocence Project, that it was founded by Barry Schecht, right. who was one of OJ's attorneys. Do you find that resonates with people or do they say to you, oh, well, he's a defense attorney. Of course, this is, you're a defense attorney. You're going to have to represent guilty clients. Well, if it weren't for the patterns, there's more than just that one pattern. So, for example, Kim Kardashian. The reason we know her is because her last name is Kardashian, who became famous because he was friends with OJ and was his lawyer in that case. That's why Kardashian is a name and then became a brand. So she got this huge head start with that. And what is she doing? She is throwing her weight around on cases that she knows next to nothing about, and she's completely ass backwards wrong on. And so it's not just Barry Sheck, it's Kim Kardashian. Wow, throwing her, case, her weight around on cases she knows nothing about. Wow. Not the kettle. And who's was living the legacy of Bob Kardashian. And it's like, they got a double murderer free and the guy's playing golf right now. And he's doing fantasy football. And that is supremely irritating to me. I cannot believe he's still alive, quite frankly. But the pattern I have noticed and I am willing to breach into is the Innocence Project seemed to be trying to set exclusively black people free, which I get that they're disproportionately murderers, but there's a lot of other murderers out there. And specifically, black murderers who murder white people. And that is untrue. I, I've told Devin Tracy it's untrue more than more than once. Jamie Snow, Richard Glossop, Darley Routier. I mean, the Innocence Project has gone to bat for a lot of white people too. Just because I, I think Devin sees it this way because this is his interest. And uh, and there was a period right after George Floyd where the big cases were, they were always going to be the death row cases. Uh, Julius Jones, Rodney Reed, Kevin Cooper, right? Is Kevin Cooper on death row? I believe so, right? Yeah, I think so. It's just so ridiculous because California is just not going to execute anyone. It, so it's just sort of a null and void issue. Tommy DV, thank you for the $5 super sticker. Really appreciate it. Okay. Back to the interview with Devin Tracy. If you're just tuning in, I'm talking about Devin Tracy and the support of Amanda Knox. You, If you're just catching up earlier in the show, I made some predictions about where I think he's going to go with his Amanda Knox love letter, pro innocence fraud propaganda for one of Meredith Kircher's killers. And it's weird that no one has connected those dots. Rodney Reed did not rape and kill a black woman. He raped and killed a white woman. And Kevin Cooper killed an entire white family. It's like it's the same people and it's the same dynamic. And look, I'm old. And there's Richard Glossop who killed Barry, who who was murder by a higher case, who was the mastermind behind Barry Van Trees' murder, white man. And Kim Kardashian is out there tweeting to support him. So there's a little problem. A, he doesn't have an alliterated name, and B, that doesn't follow the pattern, so you're just going to ignore it. And that seems to be a theme with, with everything with Amanda Knox, 
So if it doesn't fit your pattern, she's young, she's pretty. She did this in concert with two other people. This crime doesn't make sense. And like I've always said, group crimes are very hard to imagine. There's a lot of chaos, a lot of activity going on, and it's impossible. I know the prosecution scientifically put together what they thought, where that where the altercation happened in front of the wardrobe. Meredith Kircher was standing up and then her body was moved and positioned using the same kind of forensic science techniques that we use here. But if you're an Amanda Knox supporter, none of that's going to mean anything to you because none of it, the evidence that makes Rudy look bad and convicted him, that's going to have absolute sacrosanct, absolute importance. But the evidence against Amanda and Raph, forget it. Not important. Just believe Amanda's word and Raph's word. Why? Because because they're, 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 they were young and good looking and young, good looking, upper middle class people don't do that. Oh, boy. Boy, is that boy has true crime history told us that is untrue. School, I guess I thought that there are things more important than racial tribalism and, you know, race anything. A couple things come to mind. Condemning rapists and murderers. Is that not something? I- yeah, I thought there was more important things than racial tribalism, too, Devin. I can expect from my fellow man. Apparently not. What do you think's going on with Kim Kardashian? Is this just sort of a extreme daddy issue or? <sighs> yeah, I could see that angle. I mean, she's following literally in the footsteps of her father, although her father was torn up about it. I don't know. How did he die? He died early. Of cancer. Cancer mm-hmm. or something. Yeah. He definitely knew OJ killed his friend. Nicole was his friend and Ron Goldman. And so I don't know how that sat with him. I mean, he wasn't even a criminal lawyer, was he? Wasn't he like a like a civil lawyer? Thought so. Either way, I don't know what she's doing. I mean, she's obviously got her head up her ass, and she has many pursuits. And I think she wanted a little gravitas to her life. You know, she got a little bit sick of the vapid, insipid nature of taking selfies and look at me, aren't I pretty? Yes, we get it, Kim. You're pretty. So she wanted to be a part of history and set people free. And I think there's a almost a god complex. You know, maybe some of Kanye's god complex rubbed off on her. And I don't know what she's doing. Is that what you're suffering from, Devin? A God complex? Doing, And it's deeply embarrassing. And it's a sign of the times. Why does a woman like that or anyone like that have the platform she does? You know, these are questions like, hey, like on this Purvis Pain case I talked about, I talked about a TikToker and she's has millions of fans on Instagram. She's 19 years old. She knows nothing, diddly dick about what she's talking about. And she's trying to get Purvis Pain set free. So what if you're a huge makeup icon god and you suddenly decide, you know what, now that I have this platform, let me get this murderer out of prison. What do we have in our society to safeguard against that? Nothing. So technically it's freedom of speech. TikTok's not going to shut them down. Facebook, no one's going to fact check them on this. Meanwhile, YouTube and other places, uh, I was kicked off YouTube. They will operate their terms of service in really jacked up ways. But when it's expressing an opinion that is this just dementedly wrong, there is no oversight to this. The news is not going to cover this. No one's going to fact check this. And so what you end up happening is millions. And how many of your friends are going to, how many of your fans are going to fact check your Amanda Knox pieces? I'd say next to none. How many of them are going to go through the Italian documents and all the evidence? Maybe Maybe 5%, maybe 10% at most. Millions of people are influenced by these influencers in a terrible way, the worst way possible. Do you think that the Innocence Project, when I say the Innocence Project, I mean the small ones, state by state. Do you think that this whole movement is really for young people who haven't lived, who have no BS meter? Yeah, people are so easy to just persuade and it's it's the power of persuasion and that's what we're seeing are they easy to persuade i don't know if i found them that (laughs) easy to persuade oh brian m why did rudy stay silent is he being paid regular installments to stay quiet no he hasn't stayed quiet for one he 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 test he testified my understanding is that he implicated Amanda and Raph 
at his trial. I have not really explored his trial. I am ignorant of it. So let me, but I am aware that he has implicated them in the media, certainly. And I, if you go back early on in this episode, uh, I show a piece where he says, Amanda Knox is 101% guilty while telling a totally ridiculous story. So I think the best thing to do is disregard Rudy Goudet's words altogether. I think in the beginning, they were all trying to hide the group crime. And so Amanda could say she was with Raph. That was normal. And they, if they had stuck with their alibi... I don't know if they would have gotten away with it. They, they left a lot of a lot of evidence. And by the way, the DNA evidence on the knife is not blood DNA. It's different than Philomena's, right? That's DNA that lights up under luminol. This is just DNA. And I have read and I, I'm working hard to verify, but it's like the the chances that it would be someone else's DNA other than Meredith Kircher's on the tip of the knife, I have read is something like, oh, I think it was like one in, what was it, like 300 million billion or something crazy. Let me, oh, okay, one in 300 million billion. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. But I don't know. I don't know. Take that with a grain of salt. Let me get, let me go research it some more and see if those are really the odds. But it is odd that her DNA would be found on a knife found in Raffaele's drawer. It just a little bit of it, not a lot. So the fact that one more time, I'm just really trying to make my point clear is that when you have low copy DNA, it often will not show up on the second test. And that is why it's always like with these cold cases, uh, really important that they, when they test the DNA, that they test it perfectly the first time because often there's not a second chance to do it it degrades sometimes like with this knife it was cleaned i've always known advertising works i came from advertising background but i mean just look at a hypnotist go look at a darren brown video where he explains to you how easy to completely gain mastery over someone's mind and it's a scary thing to witness. And what has the internet shown us? It's shown us that we've seen this play out so many times. Look, <laughs> not everything's equal. Not everyone deserves a microphone. It's very sketchy that everyone can vote. It's frightening that everyone can be considered for a jury. Not every other country does it like that. Germany has a completely different system, for example. So yeah, it raises a lot of alarming questions. Um, one thing I will point out is the race aspect of it because that's my general focus is on that, only because it's not interesting. So like Scott Peterson murdered his wife and unborn child. I know that. Everyone knows that. Ted Bundy. So it's not interesting when, when white people kill. It's only interesting when black people kill. Hence the intense focus on Rudy Goudet. Charles Manson, Ed Gaines, all these people, terrible. But there's no interesting aspect to their race. It's There is no white equivalent of the Innocence Project that is trying to get white murderers out of prison who have killed black people. And if there were, I would cover that. I mean, I'm kind of... You would cover that. Does that mean you would support it or you would just cover it? Meaning you would be equally as offended if there was a white Innocence Project? But, you know, I, I, I've made the point the Innocence Project represents plenty of white people. Richard Glossop, Jamie Snow, Darlie Routier all come to mind off the top of my head because they're all cases that I've talked about. I'm kind of scared to go into the Innocence Project and see all their cases and research them all. I wish I had a team behind me, but I do know that it's a never ending well of content. Oh, oh, it is. And they just the money. I mean, I inter Why do you need a team behind behind you? I've done this as like a one woman band. It takes, it's a lot of work to go through all the transcripts, but you're not going to do it unless you have a team behind you. That's why you're running to Frank Sforza's website and just repeating everything you read there and not checking whether it's true or not with the original documents. Okay. All right. 
interviewed Jennifer Bishop Jenkins, whose sister was murdered. And she talks about just the juvenile aspect being a billion dollars movement to end life without parole for juveniles. So that's a billion dollars. So the Innocence Project at all has to be at least that. How do they have funding? And Their main objective is to end life in prison for juveniles. Life without parole for juveniles, right. So she got into it because she worked with Brian Stevenson, who wrote the book Just Mercy, which I call Just Money. And she's very anti-death penalty. And she worked with him to end the death penalty for juveniles who were convicted to the death penalty. They did that. And then immediately they went after life without parole for juveniles and to the most scary cases. And they use pictures of six and eight year olds when, you know, that. Just just a small point, not connected with my other points. But if you are a juvenile and you get life without parole, what you have done is so heinous. Your age is such a mitigating factor in sentencing is what I mean. It is so rare that a juvenile will get a life sentence. You have to have done something so off the charts, morally reprehensible, offensive, et cetera, et cetera. You know, with no with no chance of 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 redemption. Average mm-hmm. killer is really like a 16, 17, 15 year old minimum. It pushes some really interesting ethical questions to the forefront and I don't remember discussing these things or having a vote on them. Um, Obviously, it's worth uh, reviewing and updating, you know, from time to time. Like, for example, even age of consent. You know, the more I've traveled the world, you come to find out, hey, other countries have a totally different conception of that. Uh, that, This part makes me want to throw up every time I hear it. I'm not for lowering the age of consent, nor am I behind the legalization of prostitution and if you have sat through any trial like the like i have like with the larry ray case where prostitution is a big part big part of one of the victims of larry ray's experience i just all i could do in that trial was imagine what if prostitution were legal she would have no claim it would all be her empowering career choice but definitely Devin and I actually got into a big argument on his second interview in the middle of it, talking about, it wasn't an argument so much as a debate, but Devin kept saying, but they get paid, but they get paid. (laughs) And I think I said something like, well, why don't you do it? (laughs) Why don't you do it, Devin? There's room for you too in that field if you want it, but no man wants to do that because it's demeaning and they know it. Now, America kind of, we think everything we do is correct, but there's people all around the world that have a totally different system on a lot of things, from sex work to uh, healthcare to age of consent. But I mean, considering minors, I mean, murder is murder. This leniency on a young person, my instinct is not there. I do not have that much leniency. You have these two young girls who just killed this Uber Eats driver, and they're going to basically daycare for a few years to get, you know, some high school equivalency and to surf the internet. In Washington, D.C.? Yeah. Is that the Washington, D.C.? Right. Oh. They're going to be out at 21, and it's like, what? what is this? Is that justice? I mean, nowhere is this a bigger movement than the U.S. So why do you think this idea of the wrongfully convicted person being sort of the ultimate injustice and being so popular, why does this resonate so much in, in America? Just not for nothing, but just check out this campaign to end life imprisonment. They 20 years is enough. That's their their motto. 20 years is enough. That's what they that's what they that's what they want to put in into law in America all in every state. That you can't give a convicted killer more than 20 years. So just imagine, just imagine what, what, what that's going to be like. I hope I don't live to see it. Yeah, there has to be a psychological reason behind it, an emotional reason. I do find it interesting that the people that get behind a person who is so-called wrongfully convicted, on their timelines and in their lives, they will not also condemn 10 people that are completely guilty and highlight that and showcase that and virtue signal like, hey, by the way, I'm trying to get this one guy out of jail because I think he's innocent, but This guy over here, you know, it's just not conducive to their objectives. 
Right. So what he's saying is, what he's picking up on is, in the wrongful conviction movement, you cannot just promote the innocence of one killer. You have to accept everyone that the Innocence Project promotes as innocent. Because if one person that the Innocence Project is promoting is really guilty, then that makes the public think about what about all the others? I think uh, Martin Pribe described it as it's like these wrongful conviction cases are like a dam that's not safe. And if one start one comes down as totally a false movement like Adnan Syed or the West Memphis Three, then people have to start thinking about all the others that are being promoted. So we have to really look at the human behavior and this characteristic that is so commonplace and think, what social benefit do they get? Clearly, they're doing it because they like the way it makes them feel and they think it earns them points. Now, other people, they make money off this. So you can understand the grifter aspect of it. You know, that's sort of a shrewd outlook on it. But for the common person, like, it's so easy to not be a moral monster. And yet they are. And a lot of it's regurgitation. So they see it on their timeline. They just retweet and just regurgitate whatever they heard. So if it's from someone they like and it's like, oh, I like the way this woman's face looks. Right. So I agree with it. I'll just go to Frank Suarez's website and regurgitate it. So let me try to get this murder out of jail. <laughs> like, I mean, it's a disconnect for me and I'm trying to understand it. Mm. I don't think they understand it. So I think they're doing this unknowingly, which kind of makes it scarier. That's very interesting. So you just did a fantastic series on your channel on Censored TV on uh, Purvis Payne. Can you talk a little bit about why Purvis Payne was convicted and what the most clear and convincing evidence against him is? <laughs> I know there's a lot. How long you got? Okay, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, God, if you just heard his version of what happened, it's kind of unbelievable. But yeah, Purvis Payne is a guy... Uh, he was about 19 years old, maybe 20, uh, in 1987 in Tennessee, small town. He was um, slow dude, developmentally challenged. They later tried to call him retarded and say, you can't kill him because he's too dumb to kill. But um, he raped, or, or at least tried to rape and murdered a single mother and her baby infant daughter, Lacey, who was two and a half, and stabbed up real bad her three and a half year old, Nicholas Christopher. He survived by a complete miracle. And the evidence, I mean, his blood is everywhere. He says he was at the crime scene. <laughs> he says he cut his hand trying to help her get the murder weapon out of her neck, which is that even logical? <laughs> like she was attacked. She had 82 knife wounds on her and like, okay, he's trying to pretend like the knife was lodged in her neck as the final thrust and his way of help. Talking about illogical things. Why would Amanda Knox have such a clear memory of everything she did the night Meredith Gertrude was murdered until her alibi gets removed? Then her memory becomes really hazy and she starts falsely accusing her boss, Patrick Lumumba, who was really nice to her, of being the sole killer and putting her hands on her head, started shaking and saying, it's him, it's him, acting like she was afraid of him. That's a disconnect for me. Speaking of disconnects, that's a disconnect. Why, the amount of evidence against Amanda Knox would be enough against any one of your illiterati but not because it's Amanda Knox. It's something else. It's a woman. Is it because it's a woman? Is this like some kind of failure to, to see 
or it's a, she's a white woman. I, I don't, or that it was a group crime, but you seem to understand the central park five and why Mateus Reyes wasn't the sole attacker in that situation. But here it's just like how strong the evidence, the evidence you're going to consider has very much to do with who it's attached to. And do you think these investigators knew that when they were collecting it? Helping was to pull that out. And somehow in so doing, he got all sorts of blood all over him. He then ran from the cops. He then lied to the cops. He discarded his bloody clothing. There was blood all over his watch. He was seen at the crime scene. A policeman saw him running from the crime scene. I mean, it, it's comical. I mean, it's almost more evidence than O.J. Simpson, which it's stunning, stunning that the Innocence Project picked that case. I mean, it's almost like this is a movie, you're probably too young to know this, Trading Places. Sure. No, I'm probably older than you are. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> so Trading Places, these two rich guys make a bet. And the bet is, can we, I don't know, ruin one rich guy and take this bum, Eddie Murphy, and trade places and have him become super successful? And they're just messing around with the world for their own amusement. That, to me, is the only explanation why the Innocence Project would pick the guiltiest guy in the world to flex their power and be like, look what we can do. Even though being developmentally disabled, yeah. he took the stand in his defense and he made a very interesting admission. Can you talk about that? Well, I mean, there's so much to go after the guy. I cannot believe they chose to put him on the stand. <laughs> I but, can't um, believe his lawyer let him, but okay. I know. Like, what was that? So he had blood all over him, but specifically they were acknowledging that he had blood on the tops of his shoes. So he was trying to say that blood got on him because he was trying to help this woman who and her babies who are lying there bloodied and you know dying or dead. And so I don't know if he was like wrestling with them or what he was actually doing, but how did the blood get on the top of your shoes? So he was asked that in cross-examination and he slipped up and said the truth. And he said, oh, that must have been when she slammed up against the wall. And the prosecutor could not believe what he had just heard. And Purvis tried to back off of it and fumbled over his words. And he just got grilled on it and they pinned him on it. So it was rather obvious that. You know who also had footprints in blood, in Meredith's blood? Amanda and Rav. Rudy Gooday's shoed footprints. I mean, isn't it odd that these, that there's all these Footprints that show up under luminols if they've been cleaned. And one giant footprint of Rudy, of, sorry, excuse me, of Raph's foot on the bath mat. Now, Amanda Knox supporters like, and Amanda, uh, Raph's defense team, and Amanda Knox defense team, try to say that that was Rudy Gouday's footprint. But boy, does it not fit. And boy, does it fit like the Cinderella slipper for... Raffaele Solicito. He slipped up and said, oh yeah, that is when the blood got on me. I mean, there was other crazy things like his baseball hat was wrapped around the dead little girl's arm up to her elbow. So like her arm went through the back of his baseball hat and it was just sitting there. That's how we found her. And they had no explanation for that. It was like, oh yeah, that's weird. <laughs> that's interesting. And so I think as a great social experiment, if we're about to kill him and they're going to set the new execution date, it got pushed back for Corona. But if his final words are, hey, guys, really appreciate the love and support. I was trying to get off, but I think before I meet my maker, I just want to come clean. I did kill those people. I was, I'm sorry. I was on drugs. I was drunk. I made a mistake. I apologize to everyone involved. You know, something like that. What would the ripple effect of that admission do to the army, the millions of people who have stood behind this guy, what would they do? What sort of public gesture or exhibition would they do to apologize in shame for doing what is unthinkable? And it's not only unthinkable morally, it's like intellectually it's unthinkable. How could you? I agree it is unthinkable morally. That's why we speak out about it. It's not a question of being right. If I'm wrong on any of the cases, I'll be the first person to come out and say I'm wrong. But I'm just not willing to overlook all the evidence against Amanda Knox just because the Supreme Court wrongly threw out all the DNA evidence. I don't have to throw out all the DNA evidence. They had no jurisdiction to throw it out. And that's what political pressure will do. Speaking of political pressure, Purvis Payne 
eventually got his sentence commuted from the death sent from a death sentence to life in prison. But it's not life in prison. Looks like he might be paroled. He has an avenue to be paroled now. That's what this movement is about. They never say die, and it doesn't matter how guilty their clients are, how morally reprehensible and disgusting they are, how predatory they are. And that's why it's also a movement full, full of predatory, narcissistic, psychopathic people joining hands to represent psychopaths killers, deranged, and dangerous people. If you're not bothered doing it and you know it's, and you're doing it for the money and for the fame and for the virtue signaling accolades, because let me tell you one more time, there's no money, no accolades on this side of the fence. You'd be so dumb as to think this guy's innocent. And the only way, if you just read the Innocence Project's propaganda, maybe I would say, okay, yeah, the Innocence Project are here. They're culpable. They're to blame. But do you have any curiosity or skepticism? Did you even inquire as to what the case against this guy was? I don't think they do. I know exactly what the headline would be. The headline would be that he was coerced into a false confession. <laughs> at his execution. That would be the the headline. Right. He was tortured before they killed him because it wasn't enough these evil people to kill him. They had to torture him and have him confess as a punishment. <laughs> the selective humanizing. Like so the Innocence Project will put baby pictures and interview his father and his mother and we'll talk about what a nice child he was. And the victims get completely ghosted. There's no just like how Amanda Knox's mother and father did interviews together, trying to make it look like they were still together when they were divorced and they were both remarried. Amanda Knox's mom was married to a man much younger, very close to Amanda Knox's age. I mentioned this because people have mentioned that it was upsetting to that was that marriage was upsetting to Amanda Knox. I don't know if it was or not, but there you go. They also showed pictures before Amanda Knox gave interviews of her looking wholesome and cute in hats, smiling with her sister. And then when they finally, when she finally got out, they had her on swings, swing on the swing set with her sister doing juvenile things. So it fo follows a pattern completely is what I'm saying. It's not a, a, it's not only, you know, it's not a black or white issue. They use the same techniques no matter who the convicted killer is that they're trying to magically erase all the evidence for. Acknowledgement as to why we are here. Purvis Payne is an unremarkable man who led an unremarkable life. The only reason I know his name is because he did a despicable thing to an innocent family. But once again, it's the ultimate reversal because he's the victim. He was helping. Mm -hmm. One of the things his sister says is he wanted to help everybody. And even if you take Purvis Payne's story that he was a good Samaritan, uh -huh. he neglected to do the, the two most important things. One, try to save these people oh by God. compressing the wounds and staying there. Second thing is to call for help. And third thing is not to assault the police officer on your way out. But OK, so, <laughs> you know, even I mean, you look at the Michelle Carter case, which is a suicide case. And the thing the judge really said is that you knew this guy was in this truck and he was dying and you did nothing. You didn't get help. Mm -hmm. So Michelle Carter, another pretty woman. Now, she wasn't convicted of murder, a lesser crime. But what the judge really said in that case, it's one of the most misunderstood cases, is that the fact that she listened on the other end as her friend committed suicide and didn't call for help, that was what made her culpable, not the text messages encouraging him. So often people will frame it as like a free speech case, but that is not the case. But there's another example of a young upper middle class woman who did something really morally reprehensible and criminal and got convicted for it. So, you know, I really encourage my audience to uh, watch your episode. 
especially to listen to Nicholas explain uh, what happened. You know, I think every TikToker who supports this guy should be forced to watch him. Oh, yeah. We should tape open their eyelids and have them watch this because a guy survived this attack. And now is his voice being amplified? No, I had to find some obscure documentary that was made on some little channel. You know, it has no exposure whatsoever. If you Google search any of this, you're never going to find this thing. But I had to showcase it because it's this guy in his own words explaining what happened that day. And as far as Purvis Payne not helping them, I mean, we have his fingerprints on the telephone. Well, he, his fingerprints are everywhere in the apartment, malt liquor cans, everything. But he picked up the phone. He said, I was going to call 911, but I forgot the number. <laughs> We've had 911 as the emergency phone number since 1968. So his whole life, it's been 911. And he didn't know what, you know, he forgot. And then he, he goes, okay, well, then I thought I'm going to go out and knock on some neighbor's doors and then have them get some help. He didn't do that. Well, a cop could help. No, instead, he chucks a duffel bag at the cop and runs away. And you say, oh, why is it that people get behind this victim thing and they portray him as a victim? Well, what it tells me is maybe their heart is in the right place in a stupid way where they think, I care about victims and I don't want to see my fellow man be victimized. But if you did care about victims, you'd be caring about Nicholas Christopher, Lacey Christopher, and Cherise Christopher. Those are the actual victims, you morons. It's out of sight, out of mind. They don't know those people. They don't see those people. And those people are not the center of the propaganda. So therefore, they're irrelevant. Yeah, just like just like Meredith Kircher is irrelevant in your pieces. You called her the body, that girl. You don't see her out of sight, out of mind. And it's just so funny that you do exactly what you're talking about in this interview. Go directly to the propaganda, repeat it. Don't look deeper into the case. And I am 100% sure that you're going to use that footage of Rudy Goudet or the example of Amanda Knox and Raf's defense team showing how easy it is to climb the cottage bars when there was no bars on the cottage during the time of the murder. But your audience won't know that, so it's not important. Just show that it's that he really could break in through the wall and he didn't have to climb it like Spider-Man. But that there were no bars on the wall. And even if he could scale the wall, he would have had to have stepped on a nail coming out of the cottage that would have bent. And it was in perfect condition. It was raining the night before. The grass under the window, Philomena's window, was not pressed down. Hey. So this sounds like he's described as sweating blood. He's covered in blood. He's fleeing the scene. This sounds like a, a case that needs to be solved with DNA. Yes. So how did they get a judge to agree to test the DNA in this case? And what were the results? Thank you for setting me up with the softball. I love it. So, okay, yeah, DNA is necessary here. This is a real iffy case. We're all 50-50 on this. Uh, I do want to mention, I mean, I don't want to be too crass, but the fact that we found her dead body with the 82 stab wounds, uh, 42 of them defensive, but also her tampon was out. Now, I'm not a woman. I do not menstruate. Why would I pull my tampon out in the middle of being attacked? I don't think I would. I think it's very damning. The tampon string was one of the things they tested for DNA. They also tested a washcloth and, drum roll, the murder weapon. Now, they asked for this DNA. So the whole thing is it doesn't matter. What result is going to prove this guy's innocent? Mm. I mean, just think of it. People, they think DNA is like a Hail Mary pass because it was for some other cases like the Central Park Five who are all completely guilty. And that is ridiculous. And you should watch my series on that. But it is not a Hail Mary pass. You cannot win with this. There's evidence that this guy was at the scene. He did this act. And so what are we supposed to find? And their answer is they're hoping for the DNA of someone else. And then let's run that through the database and let's see if we get a ping. And oh, it's this other guy. And oh, let's research that. And oh, yeah, it's over there. Now, obviously, they're not going to find this. But you have a kitchen knife. They test it. What do you know? It comes back his DNA, his DNA, Purvis Payne's DNA is on the knife. But they also found a partial degraded, not good enough to be an official profile, male unknown DNA. So it's on a kitchen knife. So it's probably one of her boyfriends who was dating some guy. Can I stop you right there? Because this is a part I'm confused about. Okay. Is this a partial yeah. DNA profile? Yeah. So that means it's going to be unknown 
it's just partial. It can't be. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a nothing. It's an absolute nothing. Okay. So they had like two, uh, I forget the terminology, but they had two components to fill out the profile, but you needed 10 to make it official. And so it wasn't even close. It was totally innocuous. And the DA from the region, she points out, like, we have no idea when that DNA was put there, hmm. which is not a minor thing. He never been to this apartment. His DNA is there, and we know when that was put there. Just like Meredith Kircher's DNA was found on the tip of the knife in Raffaele Selecito's apartment, kitchen kitchen knife drawer. You, how did that get there? Why was Raff so sure it was the murder weapon? If that were me, and they told me they had that evidence, I'd be like, "What? What? I wouldn't be tailoring the evidence, making up stories about how we cooked together." And if I mean, I guess it just depends also. I don't know if he understands. Is is Devin thinking that this is low? A partial is the same as low copy, meaning a little bit of it. Right? A partial where it's like the difference between, say, like two alleles and nine. I don't I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't get it. That means like when there's two two alleles matching, that's my understanding is that, and I'm not a DNA expert, so take this with a grain of salt. My understanding is that that can never be matched to anyone because you're just going on two, like say you have a clue, like you need 10 and you only have two clues, like two, two clues, you know, and it would just be not ever be enough to solve a puzzle. There'll be, there's too many probable factors hold on i think i have a super chat here thank you thank you brian m you ever hear that oj's son is the one to kill his mom do you mean oj's first wife or do you mean because my understanding is that that son comes from his first wife uh uh, oh, do you mean Nicole and Ron? He was obsessed with knives. I had heard that and had rage issues, even hospitalized because OJ wanted to take the heat off his son. Why? I I think that's not a good theory. Although I have, I am one of the few people who have read OJ's book. If I did it, because it came into Oprah magazine when I was working there, so it was free. So I just thought it would be an easy fun you know, quick read, see what he has to say. And he talks about another person, this Charlie being there. But I just think that that is more of him trying to hide his own culpability. Why I think he was the one responsible is because he beat up Nicole so much. And that's where this goes. I, I When I was working at Oprah, I was trained by Gavin DeBecker, who wrote a book called The Gift of Fear. And he's also an Amanda Knox supporter, strangely. But Gift of Fear, I still say, despite his horrible advocacy of this one of Meredith Kircher's killers, I still say it's a very useful book. And what that book says, he was raised in one of many children. So he had many siblings and he watched his dad when he got, he could always predict when his dad was going to get violent. And so he made it into a kind of I don't know how you would describe this. It's kind of a checklist. So first they start with breaking objects that are symbolic. Then it gets into threatening, controlling who you see, controlling your money. It's like a whole line of uh, domestic abuse that ends with murder. And that's where, that's where this stuff goes with people like OJ, who are so possessive, so controlling, so immoral, um, so determined to to have control over their partners. That's the end result is, you know, he was stalking her. That's also really at the end of the checklist before things get violent. He was stalking her. That's why I think it was him. Could he have had his son help? I don't know. It would be an unusual crime if that's the case. I just haven't seen any ev evidence implicating anyone else. But if there is, I'll definitely be... I would definitely talk about it if there's good evidence against him. I just haven't seen any. Okay, let's get back to this. 
even he says that he says oh yeah i cut my finger helping her pull the knife out of her neck okay i mean it's it's to a point of like is this monty python this is the best they got <laughs> it's so true so true and then just juxtapose that with nicholas christopher and they're talking about how he had to what was he three and a half years old had to hold his intestines yeah He's, he was stabbed through the floor. And he shows his scars. See, all the way to the hospital. I mean, yeah. I mean, it, it would be funny, but it's so dark. He didn't get the death penalty for stealing a pack of gum. I mean, this is a, such a horrendous case. Yeah. And where my mind goes, which is a little bit scary and dark for me, is I'm trying to get inside this mind. I'm trying to, like, I'm trying to make some sense of it. You know, if you see a bank robbery, you get it. Like you understand what money is. You understand the want for money. You wouldn't do it yourself. You, you understand the risks and it's not right technically. So, but you can make sense of it. For a guy to rape, I can kind of understand that on a primal level. I'll, you know, obviously rape bad. Don't let me virtue signal that. And murder, okay, you lost control. You murdered this woman because you were covering up for the rape. I mean, there, there is at least a sickening evil logic to that. But then you have two babies how do you get from what you've already done to that? There's no ethical obstacle blocking you from slitting the throat of a two-year-old? As bad as murder and rape is, is that not another level of just unthinkable? It's all unthinkable. It all deserves the death penalty, whatever. Mm -hmm. But I just cannot understand what the hell he was doing. I know that one of the items they wanted to test. So what's the difference in taking part in an essay and letting Meredith Kircher drowned in her own B-L-O-O-D. I mean, what's the, what's the difference there? Is it that it's children? That is probably a little worse, but it's still in the same ballpark as Purvis Payne. I mean, this is one of the more horrendous crimes I talk about, but they're also disturbing and upsetting from the Central Park Five to Julius Jones to Purvis Payne to Richard Glossop. These victims aren't coming back and they aren't being represented. Ask, ask any American what, what Amanda Knox was convicted for. And see how many people remember Meredith Kircher's name. Asked, oh, what really hit me when I was looking at the court documents is that they wanted to test because there's so much blood everywhere. The blood on the stuffed animals. That's when I had to take a pause and a break. Sometimes it's just too much, you know? Mm -hmm. So they tested these three things, and then the other two things, the tampon, and yeah. what's the other thing? There's a washcloth, and they found semen on it. Look, the prosecution, they don't need additional evidence. Uh -huh. So, like, this guy's convicted. He's on death row. <laughs> We're about to kill him. And this happened in 1987. They asked for this DNA testing in 2006 when it was first available. Mm -hmm. And his lawyers got together and said, hey, let's test some stuff. It, it makes sense. If you're the defense team, you have nothing to lose. He's appealed, has gone to the Supreme Court of the United States for a different reason to do with victim impact statements on a murder case, which was previously not allowed, but now it is allowed because of this case. So it's a landmark case for that reason. But they also affirmed the decision. They went over everything. That's how they do that, apparently. I mean, this guy is dead to rights guilty, but they asked for DNA and the... Yeah, just like the Italian court that let Amanda Knox... And Raffaele Walk determined that Amanda Knox was present at, this, present at the scene and washed Meredith Kircher's blood off her hands and feet. They also determined that the burglary was staged and that Meredith was murdered by multiple attackers. They also determined that Amanda Knox was guilty of the felony of slander. So it's not really slander is in a good translation for falsely accusing her boss, Patrick Lumumba, of murdering Meredith. And that's why she was acquitted, just like Casey Anthony or O.J. Simpson. I mean, I don't think you would call, anyone would call Casey Anthony exonerated. That's because she hasn't had a press agency for a million dollars out there hiring experts, propagandizing her case. The court was like, why? There's zero outcome of any of this that would change anything. Our case does not hinge on one thing or two things. And you're asking for DNA. My, my favorite, by the way, is the fingernail scrapings. So 
this woman has defensive wounds. She fought for her life. She was trying to get out the door. She almost made it out the door. Mm -hmm. You know, the door got opened. People heard her screaming. They were having barbecues outside. And they saw a black man's hand close the door over and over again, slamming it shut. Not just a black man's hand, a, a black man's arm with a gold watch. The gold watch he was wearing when we found him. There was blood on the watch. There was blood on his body, blood on his clothes. So there's a picture of her fingernails. And one of the fingernails, her middle one, is bent all the way backwards, like 180 degrees. Now, under that, they had scraped out clippings or scrapings, I guess they call it. Now, at the time, they didn't have the sophisticated DNA testing. Now we do. But unfortunately, the scrapings were lost. So the defense spins this as, aha, someone is hiding them because that will show the real killer. Meanwhile, they must know that if we ever did find them and test them, it would totally convict this guy. But I think another crazy point of this is the coverage of the DNA results, which was the headline. This is my next question. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Well, what did you think about that? I've been fighting with these journalists for, th for three years about their coverage. I wasn't surprised. So these are news outlets and they cover the results, which the results came back to the guy that's on death row for murdering this family. We found his DNA on the murder weapon and on the tampon and on the washcloth. And it comes back unknown male DNA found on murder weapon, period, headline. And that's the story. That's the highlight. And then on a couple of them, like 10 paragraphs down, it says, the prosecution says that uh, this is not that conclusive because we also found Purvis Payne's blood on the murder weapon. And then they have the audacity to say, well, yeah, but that's, that fits our story. That corroborates our story because our guy says he held the murder weapon conveniently and cut his finger. You know who else cut his finger? OJ. The same day, OJ Simpson. <laughs> he said he cut his finger in a hotel in Chicago like he's the Incredible Hulk. He's drinking a glass of water. He just smashes through that and cuts his finger. And it's like a big gash. Just like Amanda Knox said, her ears were bleeding because her ears may have been bleeding because she just got them pierced extensively. But in reality, it could be bleeding from her nose or her mouth. You don't know. There is a long, there is a little time between the murder and when she talked to the police for it to stop bleeding. But clearly they were bleeding. We know they were, they were bleeding Meredith and Amanda at the same time from the mixed DNA that lights up under luminol. Luminol detects blood in the bathroom. Also, Amanda Knox's blood, lone blood sample on the sink in the bathroom, in her bathroom that she and Meredith shared. Mixed DNA in the hallway and Philomena's room. So I find her story just as ridiculous as OJ's. It's like not a small cut. It's just unbelievable. It's not, un, you know, it's not unknown. It doesn't match anyone. It doesn't match anyone. It's partial. I don't think people understand that. They'll never find a match to anyone because it's not a complete, oh, that drives me crazy. Is it stupidity? Is it <laughs> intentional? Is it malicious? I feel like the distinction does matter, but like the person that wrote that headline, how do they sleep at night? Mm. How do they look their children in the face or their family members or themselves? I never thought of myself as like, I am Joe morality. Like, I'm Yeah. I, I wouldn't think of you that way either. <laughs> not with the way you treated me, Devin. <laughs> I'm not, but. I think I'm within a spectrum of a baseline of common sense, decency. I just want to um, circle back to something you mentioned, which is where's your baseline of common sense on this case? Where are their alibis? They fell apart. That's why the Supreme Court, and they're very doubtful. Rudy, uh, Raff got a better, a sort of a better outcome with the Supreme Court, said it's very likely that he took part. But Amanda, they, they, they asserted she was there at the scene. She had motive, means, and opportunity to do it, along with Rudy Goudet and Raph. So this case was a landmark case for victims' rights, and it allowed victim impact statements into sentencing hearings. Now, I've sat in those sentencing hearings uh, where victims' impact statements were read, and they're incredibly moving and powerful and do you think that one of the reasons could be that this is some kind of revenge case? Does that sound crazy? Revenge against whom? 
it, it, because it's so damaging to the defense to have these victim impact statements read. Mm, yeah. You know, even if the judge is thinking about a sentence that has a sort of a spectrum, sometimes if, after they've sat through a whole day, eight hours of victim impact statements, they'll give on the higher end or above the, you know, Claire Bronfman was one of the sentencing hearings and they state recommended and the judge went way above, way above and beyond the um, recommended sentence. So, you know, part of what the Innocence Project says they want to do is not only exonerate, quote unquote, people through DNA evidence or the convicted through DNA evidence, but they also want criminal justice reform. Now, this was a very serious reform to our criminal justice system, the Tennessee versus Purvis Payne case that went up in front of the Supreme Court. So do you think that could be one thing or am I just getting paranoid? I don't know if paranoid is the right word. I don't know cynical, maybe the better word. Maybe, yeah. Well, I just don't know what it would do, because even if you got Purvis Payne off, it's not like that decision is going to be changed. That decision was made for a good reason, and it's the law of the land. And so even if Purvis Payne was to be set out, the victim impact statement decision is still... It's just kind of like F you. We got off the guiltiest person in the world, and look how powerful we are. Yeah. I don't know if there's that much thought, but I wonder, all this is also a death penalty case. And I find that the death penalty cases are where you get the most crazy i don't want to say just lies about the case just i'll, I'll say it the way it is lies yeah they, i mean you know even sister helen praising you know mm-hmm. a nun will openly lie <laughs> about these cases lie by omission lie directly you can understand it because if your life is on the line or if human lives are on the line things get extreme it's fight flight or lie and lying I make the point all the time. I mean, if Purvis Payne has it within him to rape and murder a totally innocent woman and her two children, you think he has a problem lying? Here's the thing. I think the Innocence Project has signed off on the idea, and as a thought experiment, what is a worse outcome? That one murderer is set free or one innocent person is put in prison for his life or killed? Which is worse? I mean, they're both bad outcomes, obviously, but clearly the Innocence Project don't care you know, they're not stupid people. They must know that they're setting guilty people free. And I just think they don't care. I think they probably think we believe in second chances and they probably. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people don't care about supporting guilty people. That's where the action is. That's where the money is. You know, not for nothing. I mean, it's a lot of what I talked about this morning or this early afternoon with Andrew Hamill. You know, They have the platform, they have the reach, they have the money, they make the media, they tell the story, they make the myth. It doesn't matter, you know. I mean, one of the more naive naive kind of parts of, I don't even know if it was naive is the right word. I don't know. Parts of Andrew Hamill's article that I disagreed with was his point that now with the internet, any case can be taken apart. Sure, any case can be taken apart, but who's going to hear Like, for example, Bill Cosby, Mark Ebner, journalist who I've interviewed uh, on this channel, he broke the Bill Cosby story in the early 2000s. Did, Did it sink in? Did anyone listen? Did anyone pay attention? Maybe a few people. But when it really broke, when all 50 of Cosby's victims came forward, that's when it really sunk in. The first couple were like negated and and sort of dismissed, but then they just kept adding up and adding up and adding up, you know, more and more coming out. So that's when it really got cemented and and understood in the American psyche. But once again, Bill Cosby, American's dad, you're kidding me. He doesn't look like he's gotten doctorates from, I mean, it's really very much the same kind of argument as saying Amanda Knox, you know, people have doctorates and who do all this good work and write books about fatherhood, don't go around Bill Cosby being women. You know, there's a shadow side to people. And psychopaths are very good at hiding in plain sight. Boy, did I find that out. We grew up in a world where they didn't have any options. They made a mistake. We believe in redemption. Maybe it's a Christian ethic. They believe in forgiveness. Did they make this kind this kind of mistake though? I mean, that's when they say the worst thing yeah. you've ever done. I made mistakes as a youth, or blah blah blah. Do you call this a mistake? Killing a two and a half year old girl, raping and murdering a mother, 
It's an insult. Almost killing a three and a half year old boy. Exactly. It's an insult to the word mistake because the damage is done. The impact is real. And that's why punishment and justice has to come. So I'm not receptive to that argument. And Kim Kardashian makes it. She says, I don't think people should be defined by the worst moments of their lives or something like that. And it's like, yeah, we get it. They're a complete screw up. And they did a horrific thing. Now, you can have honest disagreement about the death penalty. We're not even here discussing that because uh, obviously other countries do it differently. And like, But it's just really interesting as a bystander of this system that we inherited. We did not build this. It is not perfect. We obviously know that. But the actors, the players, the people that are taking part in it are so obviously hideously deformed <laughs> and they have no concern in the world about fairness or honesty or truth. It's a little bit nauseating. They don't care about fairness or honesty or truth. Interesting. Interesting comment. I mean, talking to someone who gets it like you, I rarely get the chance to do this. I often just, you know. Wait, do I get it, Devin? Or am I a, a, a stupid, broad, cat lady, don't, don't matter, so dumb, a dumb B-I-T-C-H? Do I get it? Or does my opinion on this case now make me someone who's now a quote-unquote fraud? Dumb B. I guess, I don't know. I guess that's what they teach you in Eagle Scouts. Well, speak to myself, basically. And, um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's interesting to, to listen to someone who is in this field and understands the frustration of just researching these things. I, I feel like if I had some like weird, I don't know, my, my personal addiction, my strange addiction, and it was like a support group of two, that's what I feel like <laughs> I've gotten into. SNL did a sketch the other day about uh, making fun of the popularity of true crime with women and uh, women at home alone. Like they, they'll make fun of like cat ladies, like women have loved, they love true crime. And this is like a curveball. I did not see this coming. I would never have predicted this when it comes to true crime podcasts, you know, my favorite murder, all of this stuff. It's enormously popular with women. And I don't quite understand it because a lot of the times these same women, they are adverse to the cockroach that died in the kitchen, to Ooh. the rat that needs to be flushed out, to horror films. You know, they would never watch a horror film, but they'll watch a three-hour special on Richard Ramirez. It's very interesting to me. Is it coming from a place of personal concern? Like, do you focus on cases mostly where women are the victims? Well, mostly women are the victims. I mean, we haven't talked about this. Okay. And I know my male audience gets very angry when I mention this, but, you yeah. know, men commit 80% of murders and sexually motivated crimes were in the 90s. But my interest is in the propaganda. I got really interested in this, in this subject, you know, from this angle. Yeah. And maybe it's also because my father was a screenwriter. Uh, also uh, have PR in my family. I was interested in how this is being marketed also as entertainment. Mm. I mean, this is like goes back a hundred years where authors have been, you know, they know the real story like Sacco and Vanzetti. I don't know if you know about this. No, who's that? Sacco and Vanzetti were two Italian <laughs> immigrants who in, in a robbery killed two people and they've rewritten the story in the history books and mainly because of this one book called Boston by Upton Sinclair. And he embedded himself in the defense. And now it's basically a American, I don't know what you call it. Uh, everybody thinks that they were innocent and that it was anti-immigration feelings that, <laughs> that convicted them. <sighs> and because Upton Sinclair, when he was embedded, came out years later, little piece I found on NPR was his biographer who found letters to his friends saying, I'm embedded in the defense. He watched the defense lawyer try to set up alibis for them, buy alibis for them. I know they're guilty, but I have to write a book of innocence because that's what the public demands. Meaning nobody will buy this right guy was convicted story. So I got to make money. And you see that. And that went on to making a murderer. And, uh, you know, it goes on. There's like a million cases. Whatever the case is, if it's Amanda Knox, it's, mm -hmm. you know, anti-American. Yeah, this is a really funny part of the interview. He's really silent on the band of docs. He's just like, uh. Oh. Um, but there's uh, Stephen Avery and Brendan Dassey, two more white murderers. <laughs> right? 
but this is only this is only an organization that frees black people, right? Okay. Just so you know, Stephen Avery was quote unquote exonerated of the RAPE of Penny Bernstein. Can, whatever they can, whatever cause they can pin it on, it makes them a lot of money. And then this aspect that we're talking about, the wrongly convicted movement, then the murderer, a lot of times, like we've seen in the Central Park Five, mm -hmm. I loved your series on that, mm -hmm. you know, spent a lot of time reading the court documents. It was the most nightmarish couple months of my life to report on that case. Yeah. In this, these murderers get hired by the Innocence Project. <laughs> Did they really? <laughs> so they go back into working for the Innocence Project, and they a lot of these Innocence Projects are working hand, side by side with these murderers. And then some of them, like Marty Tankliff, become lawyers and then end up representing Keith Ranieri Appeal, uh, the Nexium cult guru. Just a fun fact about Marty Tankliff: he teaches at Georgetown, so he runs one of these, like if you've seen a murder in the park, like these classes that basically solve solve crimes reinvestigate cases and try to get convicts out of prison mostly murderers because they're doing long sentences but his i really encourage that's one of my favorite episodes i've ever done i really encourage you all to check it out it's called did key did nexium's keith ranieri's lawyer kill his parents that episode it took about two years to make to find all the core documents on and off and to put it all together into a podcast i did that with alexa it was a, both of us long hard episode to put together but but a lot of fun and very interesting and very shocking how much evidence there was uh against him you know if it had been a case of innocence i would definitely have i definitely have covered it sociopathic dude marty tankliff you know he killed his parents without a doubt that took me forever to find all the court documents on that and now he is representing this guy who's no doubts the most <laughs> sadistic uh -huh. creepo man out so they i mean it all runs full circle so there's like two aspects there's like the entertainment aspect where people get rich obscuring it there's also a cause to that too they want to push a cause like making a murderer is very anti-police sentiment they push that and then just to make money the entertainment aspect but there's also the um just the wrongful conviction movement as a as a movement trying to what i think they're trying to do is absolutely pull apart they say it they're trying to pull apart our justice system by releasing as many people as they can until people have absolutely no confidence in the justice system yeah it's sickening and they're looking to do an overhaul and they have really insidious reasons and i don't put anything past them at this point but i think we stumble across something which is really interesting and i think it's all interconnected and it's Human beings have had a hard time deciphering what is true for a long time. And, you know, we come from just a sea, a vast sea of ignorance. And we chip away at it. Isn't that interesting that he started as Amanda Knox, his first episode in what I guess he says is going to be a series, talking about what's true and how we all search for what's true. Now, now when I hear it, it sounds like a con line, but I was totally roped in. <laughs> During, a, during this interview, this must be one of his lines. We're all concerned with what's true. So I'm going to tell you what's true. So you think, oh, this is a guy who cares about what's true. He's going to be doing good, thorough research on the Amanda Knox case. He's not going to, say, be showing someone scaling the villa, using the bars that weren't there at the time of Meredith's murder. He's not going to be just, like, tossing out the knife be because it's low copy DNA and it couldn't be repeated the second time it was tested years later. Interesting. I was a sucker for it. I'll tell you that. You know, we're obviously doing way better now, but we, we have a brain that is capable of believing just blatantly false things. And why do we do this? Well, because we're, we're controlled by our desire to gain pleasure and avoid pain. Now, those are the two primary functions of human beings. That's what we're always doing. That's the calculation we're always running. I didn't say gain pleasure, avoid pain, and seek the truth objectively. No, that's not part of it. You know, so people do that. So if I come across a story and it says, this makes me feel good to believe that this guy's innocent and I'm doing my part to help a guy get out of prison, 
if that sells, then that sells. And I think that people have realized and the people in power in media, they realize that it doesn't matter if it's not true. Just on a fundamental level, it doesn't matter. And once they caught wind of that, they thought to themselves, oh my God, do you realize the power of that realization? Do you realize what I can do now? If it doesn't matter what's true, then what does matter? What matters is how many Instagram followers does Kim Kardashian have? How hard is it to convince that idiot that this guy's innocent? Dr. Phil went and talked to Rodney Reed and said, I, I, I looked at this guy eye to eye. You know, he's doing this like country bumpkin crap where he's like, I looked him dead in his eye and I said, did you murder that woman? And he said, nope. And where I come from, that's good enough for me. Surprising. And it's like, oh my God. <laughs> and like Oprah Winfrey is deep in all this. I don't know if you caught wind of that, but. I work. What's the difference between Dr. Phil saying to Rodney Reed, oh, you asking him if he did it. And Devin Tracy looking at Amanda Knox and saying, she's pretty, she's white, white, upper middle class, young women don't murder. And I'm almost joking. What's the difference? I'd be curious to hear what you think. Please like, hit the bell so you'll be notified when I go live. Subscribe to this channel. Support this channel by becoming a patron. I just dropped an episode on Natalia Grace Barnett. That's in there. There's also a lot of other exclusive content for just for pay, uh, my patrons. Hit me up in the super chat if you have a question or a comment. I, yeah, I work oh, for really? Oprah. Just an interesting fact. She never wanted to do any um, stories on prisoners. Oh. She felt like she had been duped by them. Sort of. I don't know if she could say they never changed, but they would disappoint you if you invested in them. I, I'm using my words, not hers. So I thought it was very interesting when she's calling the Central Park Five exonerated and hugging them. But... You know, I connect that to Ava DuVernay and her wanting to be cast in roles. But then to put Breonna Taylor on the cover, I don't, I don't know. She's deep in it. She runs with the mood of the country. That's all I can say. And the mood of the country now is in love with the wrongful conviction movement and is in love with this story. You know, I was looking on the Internet to try to find a critical article about the Innocence Project. And I found, I don't even know how to pronounce this, but is it Kiwara? Oh, yeah, that yeah. That thing where you ask a question. Someone wrote like, has the Innocence Project ever had a major scandal? And they were like, oh, yeah. <laughs> right. There was this one time in Chicago where they, I don't know if you know this story, but I, I've done a couple episodes on it. All Story Simon and Anthony Porter. Anthony Porter was on death row. And the Northwestern Journalism School reinvestigated the case. And at the last minute, found out that he was innocent not interviewing the witnesses, looking at a totally reconstructed crime scene. So many things were wrong. Like a reconstructed crime scene, like the villa with bars on it, on the windows that wasn't there during Kircher's murder. That's how you can make those kind of mistakes, right? Mm -hmm. And they also, at the same time, forced a false confession out of someone else. So they framed an innocent man in order to get out a guilty one. Yes. So you would think that that would end the Innocence Project. They're both out now. I know. But that's just like, oh, yeah, that happened once. That was just a little blip. I mean, exactly what they say they're fighting against, you know, coerced confessions, a tunnel vision, uh, investigations, all the things. They did it. Mm -hmm. It's just like a forgotten part of history. Oh, yeah, blip. So my question is, is there anything that the, I will say, the wrongful conviction movement can do, mm -hmm. especially the Innocence Project, to tarnish its name? I mean, it doesn't tarnish their name to support Rodney Reed. doesn't tarnish their name to support <laughs> Purvis Payne. Is there anything they can do to tarnish their name? I think, sadly, the cult of wokeism is behind the movement, largely because of the racial factor. There is, thankfully, a Netflix show, I believe, about that hideous scandal you talked about where they got a murderer out of prison. Murder in the park, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they coerced some of these witnesses to change their story. And they there was some really shady, strong arm stuff going on. And I mean, it's completely obvious that they did a horrible service to justice and to society with what they did there. That was atrocious. And it was a bunch of do-gooder college kids and their professor, and they all got behind the story of look, we and this black guy comes out of prison, they hug him and like, look, I saved one. Yay. I get to go to heaven. And it's like, oh my God, what am I watching? 
But yeah, each case you list is more ridiculous than the prior. It's interesting to watch Amanda Knox's press conference at the, at when she gets out of Italian prison and she's like putting her hand over her heart and crying. And the first thing out of her mouth, the first thing out of my mouth would have been, I did not murder Meredith Kircher. She, instead, she's like, I was looking on the plane. This is my memory of it. So take this with a grain of salt. I haven't seen it in a long time, but my memory is of her putting her hand over her heart saying, I was on the plane and everything seems so surreal looking down. You know, I, I just, uh, oh, it, it's it's all about the drama of the moment. Same thing as when they released Adnan Syed. They get people in front of the courthouse to make it look like, you know, supporters, to make it look like everyone in the world is absolutely in jubilation over this criminal getting out of prison. So that the person looking at that picture thinks, what's wrong with me? Well, I guess I was wrong. Guess they were innocent. It's image management at, at, at the highest level and emotion and emotional ma manipulation and gaslighting at the highest level. That's, that's the elements of innocence fraud. Higher one. I mean, forget Kevin Cooper. The, the Chino Hills Massacre is up there. I mean, that is crazy. And like The Daily, which is the most popular podcast in the world, and they are platforming Kevin Cooper from what? San Quentin to give his side of the story. And they dedicated an entire softball episode saying this guy's completely innocent. Oh, what the hell, guys? I mean, that case is more obvious than every other one we're talking about. The pattern to me has been a wild ride and it has not been spoken of. It's fascinating that you are familiar with Oprah and have that connection, but she is deep behind this and she is pushing her ample weight around uh, financially and otherwise. I mean, she is connected. Why do you think Dr. Phil is doing shows about Rodney Reed? You don't think there was a phone call with Oprah? Oprah made that happen. Why do you think? Yeah, I, I know these celebrities have money and influence, but they're nothing compared to say like a Jason Flom, whose money helped build the Innocence Project. He has the Wrongfully Convicted podcast who constantly puts out media nonstop for convicted killer after convicted killer, case after case after case. You know, interesting fact about, about Jason Flom is I heard from his researcher once and he wanted to, he wanted to, he wanted me to share my research with him. I was like, heck no. And then you looked at his Instagram, this researcher, and he was like flying on private planes. The money on the other side is unreal. And then later on, Jason Flom's PR agency, I guess I was on a list, was like, oh, would you like to have Jason Flom on your podcast? I was like, yes, I would. I answered right away. <laughs> I was like, I'm very familiar with Jason Flom's work and I'd love to have him on for a discussion. I think I might've said civil discussion. And a lower down person said, I'm going to circle in someone higher up. And that's the last I heard of it. See, you know, Devin Tracy also in his refusal, refuse, refusal to discuss or debate is following that's their pattern. Just make the propaganda and you don't, no one has to see the cracks. I don't have to be challenged. It's just my work out there. I'll say it. I'll make it so. And I'll, and I, and I think there's like a godlike feeling in doing that. I can make something untrue true. Like I'm making I'm I'm making up my own myth now. American myth, and it, that's what these cases become. They become American myth. Whether we're talking about Sacco and Vincetti or the Rosenbergs, or the Central Park Five, or the West Memphis Three. They want to cement this myth. What do you think this West Memphis 3 DNA testing is about? That's what it's about. They haven't convinced everyone yet that, they, that they're so innocent. Well, they, they haven't released the DNA results from 2011. But they'll just, that's their own defense. Attorneys paid for those DNA tests and they haven't released them, but they'll keep asking for more. Like, oh, we know it'll exonerate us. Well, it wasn't so exonerating in 2011, or we would have seen those results. I think Gail King, her best friend, is doing segment after segment on Rodney Reed. Same reason. Ava DuVernay, why do you think she has been thrust into the spotlight, given backing, given money, 
because of her pull with Oprah. Oprah has been pulling the strings on all this stuff. By the way, I went to school with Ava DuVernay, sickeningly, at UCLA. She was in the film department there. I was in the animation department studying history and animation. And it's like, Ava DuVernay has millions of dollars behind her. She did uh, When They Rape Us. Oh, that was, that was my series, sorry. Her, her, series, her series was When They See Us. And they, meaning white people, and us, meaning black people. And like, oh, yeah, we have no reason. There's no reason why we thought these guys did what they did, aside from, oh, they're black, so they must be guilty. Ridiculous. And by the way, the black detective who arrested all those guys is still making the rounds and saying, oh, by the way, these people are all guilty. Yeah. And no one interviews him. They don't touch him with a 100-foot pole because he's counter to the story, and he is black, and he knows they're guilty. But the Central Park Five, you and I both know those people are guilty. I would say 95, 98% mm -hmm. of society think those people are innocent. Well, that's a problem. And that's a, a problem with logistics. So again, the truth doesn't matter. My series, When They Rape Us, was seen by 100,000, 200,000 people. When They See Us was seen by 40 million. Right. You know, so that's what we're up against. You know, I think women are, are more likely to be the victim of these crimes and yet I wonder if there's some sort of power they feel in nuzzling up to the brute. And I'm going to be on the victimizer side. I'm not going to be a victim. I'm going to buddy up to the victim. You know, I, I wonder if there's some kind of unconscious thing going on. I don't know how they live with themselves. Do you remember we used to see victims on TV, victims' families on TV? Even Doris Tate did many interviews, Sharon Tate's mother. Oh, you don't see even victims being interviewed anymore very often, do you? Am I crazy? No, we're being presented <laughs> the wrong victims, the false victims. We still get the victim narrative. It's just been completely contorted to a ludicrous degree. That's why I think victims' rights are incredibly important. And Yeah, that's why you just hear about Amanda Knox and how being in prison, quote unquote, falsely convicted or falsely accused is the word they use. And you never hear about Meredith Bircher and you never really hear the real evidence against her. Yeah, we are being presented the, fa the false victims, the wrong victims. People lose sight of that. And we know, we've done studies on empathy, where if you see one person who's poor and you walk by them on your way back from Starbucks and they're in the street and they're homeless and they have a little puppy with them, you feel for that person, that person is in your mind. They're in your field of vision. Now, you could send money to some charity. There's starving people in Papua New Guinea and Madagascar. You don't give a shit because you didn't see them. And that is a, such a powerful thing. And I learned this as an editor, as a video editor, having the power of the blank page as a content creator and having that godlike, I could just choose to say anything right here. What is far more interesting than what you show is what you're not showing. Yeah, like Philomena's room. That won't be dealt with or dismissed arrogantly as a just DNA, not DNA that lights up under luminol. And you're going to, I'm sure you're going to, you're going to show every time I talked about Amanda Knox's smelly, her smell being smelly and not washing, but that was one of the sources of sources of contention between Amanda Knox and Meredith Kircher. And I'm sure you're going to say it's petty and, oh, of course she murdered because she didn't flush the toilet. That's right. No, it was it was huge jealousy. Amanda Knox really liked this guy Giacomo downstairs. Giacomo was not interested. And Amanda, he really liked Meredith. There's all sorts of problems. And it was building and building and building. And Amanda Knox was running through money. We know that. And we know that her number was on a cocaine dealer's cell phone many times. And look how, look how she was sold as the girl next door who would never do this. Why was that so important for them to do? Because she had to be seen as the kind of person, because the evidence is so damning against her, who wouldn't take part in a group murder. Then they tried to straw man the prosecution's argument. And uh, sex game gone wrong was never argued in court. But and then they even put a satanic motivation to it. Like this, it's wild. 
It is an unusual crime. I'll say that. But a lot of these celebrated murder cases, fascinating murder cases are unusual. And that's why people are interested. Think of it. If I'm saying one thing, okay, that's fine. Put your attention on this thing I'm saying. What I'm not saying is an encyclopedia of stuff, infinite, and it says way more. It's way more interesting than negative space that you create by the things you don't say. And so that to me is like, you have to raise your consciousness on the fact that there are choices being made as to what you're being presented and what you're not being presented. And if the audience only knew what they're not being presented, I think a lot of hearts and minds would change. Are there subjects that you've wanted to cover, but have held that? I mean, you seem to really speak your mind. You speak very straightforwardly about race, a lot of sensitive subjects. Have there been subjects mm -hmm. that you've thought are too controversial, too sensitive, you wanted to do them, but haven't? I don't go into James Charles. No, um, I, I no, because look, I came into public commentary by talking about atheism. And that's a real F you to most of the world. You know, atheists got a bad rep because it's kind of a snotty thing to be like, hey, you know that entire thing you built your whole life around? Uh, that's all bullshit. <laughs> and you're not going to live forever. And everyone you love is going to die and enter oblivion. And you're kind of a narcissistic brat. So if I'm ripping off the Band-Aid coming out like that, why would I be gun shy on any other topic? Now, I personally come from a background where race and me have an interesting like sort of history. So I come from South Africa. My father was born there. My middle name is in Zulu. My grandfather is a famous African ethnomusicologist. He went around in the 1920s and 30s and recorded African tribal music for the first time ever and basically preserved it. He started a, a library, International uh, Library of African Music, and it's been wildly influential. He's a famous man. And my father, he spread African music around and is a great musician and a great man. But I was raised to respect Black people like I was raised in L.A. Black people are my heroes, uh, Magic Johnson, Michael Jordan, Muhammad Ali, these kind of guys. You know, I loved love me some Denzel Washington. He's one of my favorite actors. My first serious girlfriend was a half Black girl. Like, the, it doesn't phase me. I am not scared of talking about race. I'm not ashamed of my race. I am not a slave owner. I have nothing to do with this. I'm not going to pretend like blacks aren't killing people at the rate that they do. This is hideous. Like you mentioned men kill more than women, right? Like, obviously, who, who is denying that? Who is shying away from that fact? So like, I don't fear anything. And, you know, the mother of all social sort of taboo breaking things is to talk about race in an honest fashion. And I have zero problem doing that. And so if I can do that, no, there's nothing else I'm afraid of is the, the short answer to that. And is there a connection between atheism and, and the subject? Honesty, a pursuit for truth. I care what is true. So I found a lot of times talking to religious people, you'd be en entering a conversation like... Uh, Once again, there's that line, I care about what's true. Is that like, a, it's, it's like almost, <laughs> it's almost coming off like a pickup line. I care about what's true. I'm a deep thinker. I even care about taboo subjects, topics, and I'll talk about it. Uh, not a debate, but just an argument of like, who is true? You think this, I think this, let's talk about it. And, you know, you're testing your own thoughts on the issue, but you're also seeing if there's any holes in the other argument, or maybe they have a good idea that might affect your opinion on things. But I found that there's a lot of them that don't really care what's true. And they'll admit that directly and indirectly. And they'll just be like, you know what? It's my truth. They'll say some, something stupid like that. Or I have faith, which is basically, you know, a get out of thinking about something logically free card. And um, they sort of made a deal with themselves. Like, uh, or it could be Pascal's wager where it's like, look, if I'm right, I'm right. If I'm wrong, I'm not going to know about it. So that's, I'm happy with that. Now for me, I actually care. It is actually of note whether or not there is a God or not. It's not interesting to me because it's, there's no evidence. I mean, not only is there no evidence, this would be thrown out of court. It wouldn't even necessitate a trial. So it would just be like, what? <laughs> We're, the burden of proof is on you to prove God. You have no evidence. Case closed. Next. So that to me is, um, I guess, the parallel is caring about what is true and understanding that it matters. You've been banned from YouTube. I mean, there's a... <laughs> <laughs> Why? Me? What? What have I ever said? Was it one thing you said, or was there one thing that was sort of 
you think sparking it? Was there a movement? Because I, I hate to break this to you, you tend to be a polarizing uh, figure. People either really love you or they really don't like you, it seems like. First of all, that's the way it's supposed to be. Second of all, I'm proud of every enemy I have. Look, that's a really key component that I want to make a point here. And I criticize women. And I'm actually shocked that you are as actually woke on this topic as you are. Wow. I, I was woke then, but now I'm a dumb bee now. <laughs> How quickly things change. Right? He criticizes women. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, I know you criticize women. I'm getting the brunt of it now. <laughs> so funny he turns it right to women. Yeah, I criticize women. And what's wrong with you? And and then he was blaming this movement on Jews. Of which, I mean, I was raised Quaker, but if you consider it an ethnicity, I am three quarters Jewish. So, yeah, there's a lot of Jewish lawyers. But this, the Innocence Project was started by two men, Peter Neufeld and Barry Schecht. But I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's, it's just like an ultimate, like you see these patterns and you just can't, you can't uh, veer from them? What's going on? Or is it just convenient now because he doesn't want to reverse his position on Amanda Knox? Because I find, I don't know. You tell me. You tell me if you find this evidence compelling or not. That's generally what I'm hearing is what's wrong with Devin. This is a heck of a lot of evidence against one person. Not a little. And then the Supreme Court decision is so damning. That let her go. I won't say that again. I feel like you're all getting sick of it. But you know what it is. Fake the break-in, multiple attackers, wash Meredith Kircher's blood off her hands and feet. That's, the, that's her exonerating decision. Some exoneration, huh? Or because there's a lot of women, including all the TikTokers that are trying to get Purvis Payne off, who are, I would say, more likely to fall victim to taking the worst possible path on a lot of these issues. And I think it's from a tendency to try to not rock the boat, to try to gain social acceptance. Like that is of primary concern. And I My channel is uh, made up about 50-50 men and women. So there are plenty of women who agree with me on this issue, but women can be manipulated. I consider the women who really get sucked into this movement victims too. But, you know, you're always going to hear about hybristophilia. And I'm going to do more on that later. Uh, do do another video later on sometime about men who who kind of fall in love with these female murder murderers. It happens for sure and advocate for them. So I think right now women are Definitely more in the spotlight in the Adnan Syed debacle. I think there are sociologists and anthropologists that could probably attest to that. I don't care. So the idea that I have enemies is not something I lose sleep over. I want those enemies. I seek them out. I embrace. Them. Yeah, you definitely, uh, <laughs> you definitely could have le left this alone and said nothing. But you, you did seek me out, Devin, and made me an enemy. Because I didn't agree with you? I mean, come on. Come on. It's so it's so petty and ridiculous. Childish. So if I said to you, I'm going to make a video, and that video is going to get a thousand likes, and you're going to get a bunch of good comments and like some money, and it's going to be really fun, but you're going to get a hundred dislikes. And that's a hundred people and some nasty negative comments. If you present that calculation to a lot of women, I would say the average woman, she would say, I don't want to do that. I am not equipped to take a hundred insults from a hundred strangers. So I am way past the point of no return with that. It is unnatural, by the way. So when you become a content creator, it is weird to field large amounts of negative energy from strangers. The fact that it's undeserved and that they're wrong is like, it's neither here nor there. What's the most amount of people that have attacked you with negative energy in your life prior to the internet? 
a few, a couple, like what did you do? It's very rare. I'm just immune to it at this point. It's water off a duck's back and I invite it. In fact, I mean, like I want it. Let me interview, let me debate Ava DuVernay or the Innocence Project or any of these people. Like this is... Ex- Wait, you'll, you'll debate Ava DuVernay or the Innocence Project, but you won't debate me? Am I... <laughs> Your answer is that I'm just too dumb, but yet you've been on my channel twice? Why did you want to come on such a dumb, dumb, dumb person's channel? Why did you want to come on a cat lady channel? Why'd you share the video and say really nice things about me if I was so dumb? Or am I dumb now and I wasn't then? You know, it's so funny, this origin of this cat lady thing. I had to think back and I was like, why does he keep saying this cat lady thing? And I thought back and I was like, oh, yeah, when we met in New York, it was so I, I just cannot stress to you how physically uncomfortable it was because it was really cold and really rainy and we were both didn't have umbrellas. And it was during like the height of the pandemic. So there were like a lot of places you could go inside. Oh, also, Devin didn't bring his his uh, his card, his vaccination card. So we had to find someplace outside. And we're like, it was just it was just you don't know this person. Nerve wracking. So you're trying, you know, trying to sort of trying to make conversation. And I think I said something about how I didn't like it when he brought up cat ladies because I had two cats. I was just making conversation. Now he thinks it's like deeply wounding to me to be called a cat lady. It's so funny. <laughs> He's like, oh, this will really get her. She's a cat lady and she's old. Yeah, I say that like every show that I'm old. <laughs> Exciting for me. Hmm. Well, you're a brave person because I find around this subject, even to get a district attorney to talk, it's just, you know, radio silence. I, I think... The money that's behind this movement. Yes. Uh, You know, I have one more question. This is out of turn. Maybe I can edit this some way. But I really wanted to ask you about Nicholas Kristof, who's been writing these pieces in the New York Times. Did I get his name correct? Yeah, it's it's very close to Nicholas Christopher, who's the victim of that uh, knife attack. Yeah. He's been writing these, you know, love letter pieces (laughs) about Kevin Cooper case. Mm Mm-hmm. What's behind? I mean, we got a little glimpse in Murder in the Park of how that worked, of people being promised money. You know, why that case? What is he getting out of it? Is he being paid by anybody, or is this some kind of diluted passion project? I think we need to recognize that this guy is the top of the food chain type of a guy. He's sitting in an incredibly privileged position of power at the New York Times. He has a very successful career. He's award-winning, all this crap. He's done virtue projects, passion projects that he finds to be important. So I don't, he's done stuff in like, um, God, just some international crisis. I want to say like, um, I forget which one it was, but it, something like George Clooney would be involved in. Either way, it was some international thing where it's like refugee, some, something where it's oh, like, oh, you're right. He's You're doing right. something good for humanity. He's writing about something that's important. <laughs> You're so, right. So he got yeah. sort of, I think, an addiction to huffing his own farts in terms of that. <laughs> so because he's not just a successful guy, he's not just rich, he's not just all these things, he's helping the world. And they really love that narrative about themselves. And so I think that's the itch that's being scratched. Now, I did some research into this character, just trying to understand the mentality of it all. And <laughs> talk about breaking taboos. The man is Jewish. Now, I want everyone to brace themselves. I love me some Jews, many great friends who are Jews, but there is a psychological thing at play here. Now, he- But you don't love this Jew anymore, that's for sure, Devin Tracy. <laughs> His father, Nicholas Kristof's father, is a survivor of the Holocaust. Or if not the Holocaust, they had to escape persecution at some point. Mm-hmm. They had to get the hell out of Europe. That's his background. This is of paramount concern to this man. So now he's in a position of power. I don't think it's an accident that he chose to, and by the way, not just try to get a black man out of prison who had murdered white people. There's a lot of literature and research on this. This is not the first time someone has come up with this thought. They're trying to convict an innocent white man of the murder in Chino Hills. So there's zero evidence that this guy did anything. He voluntarily gave his DNA. There's no matches. There's nothing to suggest this guy did anything. A guy named Lee Furrow. And he, that's one theory, by the way. Another theory is it was three white men. There's the three white men theory. And I go over all this in my video, but 
it, it's almost like a double dip when you find someone trying to get a murderer out of prison because half the time that's just the first half of it the second half is they're trying to put an innocent man in jail so it's like wow the second one really hits you so why does he do it i think it's safe i think it's fertile territory to go after white people generally in our society today um you can do it you're seen as the david and white people are the goliath and you can make it well all these connections you want so is that why you're supporting amanda knox you think she's being put on pawn because she's a white woman that's why she was yeah see it's like these innocence fraud campaigns are always connected to a cause so that's devin's cause and and he sees a connection and he's going to passionately advocate for her innocence no matter how how much the evidence doesn't support it none of them make sense white people were nazis white people own slaves Therefore, screw these white people today and let's pin a murder on Stacey Stites' white husband because, after all, he is white. It's a weird, misdirected funneling of something, an emotion, a resentment, something internal. We are witnessing play out in public in a very bizarre way. And I'll, I'll leave it there, but that is my gut instinct on a man like him. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. I, I've, I've kept you too long. Well, it's been very fun for me. I've really got to clarify some of my thoughts and I've ventured into some new territory, piecing all these things together, because it's really interesting to zoom back and look at it from afar and sort of see the larger themes, the larger patterns going on here. Because a lot of times it's just, here's one case, here's another case. And you burrow down into those details. And if you left it there, you'd be leaving most of the interesting part of the story because you really have to see it in its entirety. And I think you, based off the experience you have and the dedication you've put into this, it would be impossible for you not to notice a lot of these patterns. And as long as this wrong for- How Have I been dedicated or have I just been a dumb bee who's a fraud? Isn't that funny? <laughs> I, was, I was a dedicated researcher up until when I publicly disagreed with him. Full conviction money keeps. And, you know, the taxpayers are paying for this, basically to pay off guilty murderers for their crime. I mean, I have been saying it's the biggest fraud in America, and no one's talking about it. It's so odd. It's such an odd feeling. This is a massive story. Like, this is the kind of thing where in 100 years, people are going to be like, wait, you just sat there and let the Innocence Project do what? It's crazy. Somebody has to put the pieces together or get funding in a way. Like imagine if you had funding and you came to Netflix and you said, "Uh, Netflix, I'm going to expose the lies in the Ava DuVernay series when they see us. And I have a huge film production company behind me. Will you platform my movie? They'd be like, hell no. This is counter to the story and it's going to make us look bad. We're going to take heat for it and we're going to lose money. Money is more powerful than truth. Is that fair? I mean, is this not something that someone is thought about i'm sure if you type that into google somebody's thought about it <laughs> it's so much like the player do you remember that movie the player yes. the end, do you uh-huh. think about that that end scene with innocent people all right i think that's uh, i think that's enough of that um this is just talking at the end oh you guys bored want to watch one more thing before before i sign off for the evening let's see I had one more thing I wanted to show you I thought was interesting. This is like the most even-handed. This guy made two videos, one on Amanda Knox, why she could be innocent, and one why she could be guilty. And you can see that he's obviously more on the, just by his collection of books, like he has Raph's book, Amanda's book, and he has just Barbie... Lataza, I don't even know how to pronounce her name, Nadeau's book, Angel Eyes, which I've read. But even after I read that book, I was still supporting Amanda Knox. It was un- unreal, unbelievable. But let me see. Let me see if let me see how long this is. If it's really long, I might save it for another time just before quickly. All right. Um, 
see. Okay. Tonight's presentation, the infamous murder case of Amanda Knox, the American student killer, as some people refer to her as, who was accused and indeed went to jail but was then liberated for the murder of Meredith Kircher, a young English student who in 2007 studied in Perugia, in Italy. They shared the same cottage. Now for the sake of this presentation, I'm going to assume that you're conversant with all the material in the case, and I'm just going to bring to bear from my experience, having read almost every book that was written on the case that was worthy reading, I have a smattering of the books here. Raffaele's book, Honor Bound, where he claims that he was innocent and he stuck by Amanda even though he'd only known her for one week because as a matter of honor. Amanda's autobiography, Waiting to be Heard, where she tries to answer all the accusations against herself. Some think convincingly, other things think not convincingly at all. The Fatal Gift of Beauty, which is a whitewash of her, saying that it was because of her looks that she was framed because she was a beautiful young woman. Angel Face of Barbie Nadal, a very thought-provoking book that clearly fingers Abanda as the killer of Meredith and involves a very interesting scenario, which I'm going to get to in another video. And finally, Death in Perugia by John Folang, which is a very interesting book, is filled with facts, extremely well researched. But in addition to this, I say, I have had access to extensive information on the case and I've been involved with it. So, now, without further ado, I'm going to present the facts as they stand against Amanda Knox. First and foremost, five drops of mixed blood. Amanda Knox's blood and Meredith Kircher, the murder victim's blood, inside the house where she was murdered. Blood dries in less than half an hour. So if Amanda was not involved in the murder and was indeed not in the house, as she claims now, how can she possibly explain that there were these five drops of blood that weren't inside Meredith's room where she was murdered, it's true, but they were in the corridor, in the bathroom, and in another room. That's point number one. Um, the statistical chances of that happening are almost, uh, must be one in millions. Amanda claims that she had multiple piercings in her ear that had been recently done, and that she was menstruating, and this could possibly explain how her blood would have come to be on the faucet of in the bathroom remains extremely difficult to, uh, to explain. The second uh, fact which I want to bring in front of you is that there was a fake break-in in an adjacent room. All the affairs in the room were scattered all over and the glass, the window was broken, but the glass was on top of the scattered affairs which clearly indicated that the window was broken after somebody had rummaged through the room. So the police are almost certain that it was a fake break-in. And in that room is one of those mixed drops of blood of Amanda and Meredith. How did it get there? Very, very difficult to explain. How can one explain that Amanda was at a quarter to eight at a little convenience store the morning after the murder and that she bought bleach? In fact, when the police arrived around noon the day after the murder, they found Amanda with a mop and a bucket in her hand. She comes up with her own explanation, and in another video I'll get into that. But the owner of the store unmistakably and under oath identifies her, and must bear in mind that her physique, whilst it could be fairly usual in Seattle, stood out very much. Her pale skin and her swimming pool blue eyes were very atypical of an Italian physique. So very difficult to explain away. How do you explain that they gave each other their alibis? They said they were at Raffaele's flat that was inside the town, whereas the cottage where the murder was committed was a little bit outside of the town. Why did they say they were at a different location, use each other as an alibi, and why then did Raffaele, in his first interview or interrogation with the police, said, I told you a bunch of silly lies. Amanda went out at nine o'clock and didn't return until one in the morning, and I have no idea where she was. So, Raffaele threw Amanda under the bus in his first interview with the police of honor. I darn, I just moved the whole thing back again. I did that thing again. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, what I wanted to say was about a Raffaele 
kept with that up until it all the way, all the way that Amanda wasn't with him after nine o'clock. And why did he know that that was the time, I guess, from the first trial that he needed an alibi, but he stuck with that, that he wasn't with her. He wasn't part of it. And they just said that his footprint wasn't his footprint on the bath mat in Meredith's blood. And it wasn't his DNA on Meredith's bra clasp. So let's see if we can find where we were again. Sorry about that. At a little convenience store, the mortar after the murder and that she bought bleach. In fact, when the police arrived around noon, the day after the murder, they found Amanda with a mop and a bucket in her hand. She comes up with her own explanation. And in another video, I'll get into that. But the owner of the store unmistakably and under oath identifies her and must bear in mind that her physique, whilst it could be fairly usual in Seattle, stood out very much. Her pale skin and her swimming pool blue eyes were very atypical of an Italian physique. So very difficult to explain away. How do you explain that they gave each other their alibis? They said they were at Raffaele's flat that was inside the town, whereas the cottage where the murder was committed was a little bit outside of the town. Why did they say they were at a different location, use each other as an alibi, and why then did Raffaele, in his first interview or interrogation with the police, said, I told you a bunch of silly lies, Amanda went out at 9 o'clock and didn't return until 1 in the morning, and I have no idea where she was. So Raffaele threw Amanda under the bus in his first interview with the police. How do we explain that? How do we explain even more extraordinarily that Amanda changed her story whilst being interrogated by the police and said, whilst I told you I was at Raffaele's, I now admit that I was at the cottage. And not only did she say that, but she said, I heard these blood-curdling screams, and as she told the people present, and there were several people that attested to this, she put her hands over her ears and her whole body went into almost a convulsion. Why did she add that detail, which was corroborated by a neighbor who said that she had heard these same blood-curdling screams? How did Amanda know necessarily there had been screams? Amanda later changed her story back and said, no, in fact, the police just pressured me and they made me say that. But why did she add that piece of information? Very strange. How was it conceivable to explain? I found no explanation for this, although I thought about it for a great length of time. They introduced, as you know, the murder weapon as being a knife found at Raffaele's apartment, not at the cottage, but his apartment in his kitchen. And in the first trial, where they were condemned, respectively, it's 25 and 26 years, they said that there was DNA of Meredith on the blade and that there was Amanda Knox's fingerprints on the handle. And Raffaele volunteered to the police, perhaps very foolishly, the following piece of information. Oh yes, I recall. Once when Amanda was in my kitchen and we were preparing dinner, I pricked her finger accidentally. The only problem is it turned out that Meredith had never been to his flat and he admitted that himself later. That seems very, very difficult, if not impossible, to explain why somebody would say something like that. It seems very, very suspicious. Why was it that there were footprints in the hall outside Meredith's room leading to the bathroom that had been washed away with bleach and they were brought back to life through luminol, you know, the substance that forensic police use to reveal the presence of blood after it's been washed away? Why does the footprint on the bath mat correspond, according to all norms of forensic comparisons and police work, to Raffaele's shoe size and the exact shape and the make of his shoe? Very difficult to explain. Why did Amanda, and this seems almost unbelievable, why from prison did she reiterate her confession and say, I confirm what I said in my confession, I was at the house and I heard the screams. She did say admittedly that it was confusedly that she remembered it, that it was as if in a dream, and I'll get to that in another video. Why could it be that Amanda couldn't remember? It seemed like a strange dream. He kept some of the things wrong, like the bath mat. You can clearly see, it's even in Devin's video, you can see that it's a footprint, not a shoe print. 
but there were mix. There were mix shoe, shoe prints and ra and Rudy's shoe prints go right out the door. But Raph and Amanda's are all over the apartment. Hey, Manny, thank you so much for the 1999 Super Chat. Could victims' families, this is such an interesting question. I'm really, because I think about this stuff, like about a lot, like some kind of civil lawsuit. Could victims' families use the same precedent in the Alex Jones versus Sandy Hook, Hook case? If innocence fraudsters lie to make money off of the harassment and suffering of victims, then civil suit. Definitely it would be like a precedent-making civil suit, but what lawyers are going to want to go up against their colleagues? They'd be social pariahs. There's so many civil lawyers making money in our civil courts on these quote-unquote wrongfully convicted people. But yeah, I've often thought of, could there be some kind of, I don't know, charity, you know, exploitation thing, raising money under, I don't know. I don't know what the chair exactly are the laws and how they vary from state to state and where, say, the Innocence Project is registered to. But I've thought about the things like that because it's just getting, the propaganda is getting more and more outrageous every year. And that's why it's concerning when there's people like Devin Tracy running around saying, oh, this is just an organization that's getting out black murderers. Well, it's not. It's not at all. <laughs> they, they don't care. They will get out as many people as they, as they can. They, it is a totally convict-aligned uh, uh, criminal aligned organization that's what i can say they they align themselves with those criminals and they do what the, the way they treat the victims families is horrible and you could see that in Adnan Syed's case the way they told young lee oh you can we're sending you the zoom link if you want to check in on this hearing not like you have a right to be there under under maryland law that was just awful yeah, I was just really surprised that I wasn't certain whether Andrew Hamill was not writing about it. It just didn't seem to have any outrage over it. I don't know. I find it completely morally disgusting. And I have no love for these people. And I don't think that they think these killers are innocent. And nor do I think Erica Sutter or the or say the Becky Feldman thought that there was any real evidence supporting Adnan's innocence. They just feel he got in there as a juvenile. He's done enough time and they'll get him out, even if it's using purposely deceptive ev evidence. I mean, it's you know, we they they're given too much credit. Well, she was taking a lot of drugs and she was drinking, but that's not the subject of tonight's videos. So why did she spontaneously offer that when no pressure was being put on her if, as she claims, she was basically pressurized by the police into making a false confession? Why did she finger Patrick Lumumba, her boss, who was always very kind with her by her own... It's not a false confession. It's a false accusation. And Amanda Knox has none of the, say, recipe for a false confession. She's not low IQ. She's not poorly educated. She wasn't, by her own admission on the stand, put under pressure, denied food and water, denied bathroom breaks. And you just see such a clear break between the story that she tells before Raph pulls his alibi and after, afterwards, she's not sure, she can't remember. Before that, she remembers every little detail. Go back to my video where I read her letter home. It is like in minute detail from undressing to get in the shower. She can't just say, I, she didn't just write, I took a shower. She's like, I undressed and took a shower. It's like suspiciously detailed. That is not why I think she's, she's guilty. 
but I'm sure that will be clipped up and used against me somehow. But it's just it, it's just an interesting exercise to see how much her attitude and whole position changes. So in Barbie Nadeau's book, she says, oh, well, maybe she puts out a theory that maybe Amanda Knox really was so blackout drunk or and so uh, hopped up on drugs. I don't even hopped up is the right word because I think she just said it was like potted alcohol. I don't know if she went into the cocaine stuff anyway that she couldn't really remember but that doesn't make any sense because right before raf's when raf kept her alibi she remembered everything in minute detail how did that change i don't hear a lot of people talking about that and the more i listen to this video you know it's just very small details but that he gets wrong but it's easy to do there's a lot of details in this case and i certainly have gotten a few wrong myself so, like I said, check the description. I'm making corrections as I go. I try to be as factually accurate as I can, but I am human. Mission, and who ran a bar called The Chic where she worked, why did she finger him as the murderer when she knew that he wasn't, when he had an alibi? And why did she say I was in the cottage and Patrick went into the room and murdered Meredith? Why for two weeks did she let Lumumba sit in jail under the suspicion of murder being interrogated by the police? Very difficult or perhaps impossible to explain, although I'm not taking part for her guilt or her innocence. I'm just presenting different facts. Why, when she gave an interview to Diane Sawyer, the most extensive interview that she gave when she came back to the States, when Sawyer specifically asks her were you at the cottage that night? And of course, the whole case revolves around that. Was she there or was she not? Was she lying when she said that to the police? Was she lying when she said that she was somewhere at a different location? Why does she say no in a quite contrived way where you can, all of her answers you can feel, if you know something about forensic psychiatry, are very, very guarded and she's thinking very carefully. So she thinks and then she says no, but as she says no, she clearly nods. I encourage you to go and watch that interview. It's very, very strange and there's a real incongruency between her verbal and her nonverbal language. So that seems very strange indeed. Why did her and Raffaele turn off their cell phones that night? It's the only time they ever did it when they were in Perugia. They turned their cell phones off at the same time and they turned them on the next morning at the same time in the morning. Perfectly congruence one with the other. Well, we know that people can be traced by their phones, by their cellular phones, by triangulation and police experts can tell where people were. So that seems another fact which is very difficult to explain. They come up with explanations but they don't seem particularly credible. Why was Amanda's behavior, and you can't condemn a person just on their behavior, of course, but why did she, was she so callous, so insensitive, that all of Meredith's friends, when they were being interviewed by the police and they were waiting together in the waiting room, they, they said they found her behavior disgusting. It was so callous. She was snuggling up, kissing, acting puerile, sticking her tongue out at her boyfriend, Raffaele. At another point, she did a cartwheel at the police shop. They didn't go to the commemoration ceremony that was held in honor of Meredith a few days after she was killed, where hundreds of students went to pay homage because they were deeply touched, and of course all of Meredith's friends. And why the afternoon, or actually the early evening of that same day, where they caught on video in a shop and Amanda was buying some lingerie underwear, and why were they talking about having hot sex and giggling with each other? It seems very difficult to explain if indeed Amanda really cared about Meredith and if she had sincere feelings for her. So again, we can't condemn somebody just on incongruent behavior, but it's, some, it's a question that's worth asking oneself. So I would say these are the essential questions that arise in the accusation of Amanda. And I thank you for your attention. And I Okay. So he picked out a lot of the same points that, that I did, you know, and 
I expect I expect uh, Devin Tracy's video to have lots of things like things I pointed out about her internship and her having sex with a drug dealer on a train. But I bring up those points to say, to counter the image that was crafted for her, which was as the girl next door, the Amelie, the Faye misunderstood, Blythe, you know, like, you know, like what, like, like almost supernaturally innocent woman. She wasn't that, that image, that Amelie image was crafted. And I believe all the stuff that she put in, oh, I'm reading Harry Potter. I'm watching Amelie. See, it's kind of like her own image management of herself. See, I'm a wholesome young woman and I read wholesome young stuff and I watch sophisticated French movies with characters like me that are eccentric and misunderstood and good and well-meaning. But if Meredith was really her friend, why didn't she go to the memorial service? It seems like at least Meredith's other, all of the rest of Meredith's friends did. Why couldn't Raph and she both go? If she really was friends, but the reports are of the people who were very close with Meredith is that she could not stand her. It was like a pressure cooker, that cottage. I mean, you can see how small the rooms are. They're maximized. The whole top floor cottage is maximized for maximum space. And Amanda got the smallest room in the middle there with very dark light. And why is her lamp in Meredith's room? Expect. I expect Devin Tracy to leave that out of his video. You can't look at the totality of the evidence or it's very difficult without doing mental gymnastics and come to a conclusion of Amanda Knox's innocence. And that is true with all of these innocence fraud cases. There's a reason they got convicted. It's not like their borderline cases are close. They're usually pretty slam dunk overwhelming. That's what I've discovered. Does anyone have any questions? I'm just about to sign off before I go. All right. All right. Well, have a great Saturday night. I'm going to try to enjoy it now. And I hope you do the same. And uh, I'll see you back here next time. Please like, subscribe, ring the bell, join my Patreon, help support the channel and help spread the word about innocence fraud. Thanks so much. I'll see you back next time.